Hello everybody. Welcome to my first collection series. What this is, is once I've narrated a certain amount of stories by uh, the same author, I'll compile them into a video and then in between each story, tell you what I thought of the story, why I chose to read it, what appealed to me about it, and anything else uh, relating to the story or my channel. But I hope you guys enjoy this. Let me know what you think and if you'd like to see more of it. With that said, here are 10 No Sleep Stories, written by Decomposed. This first story is called The Body Book, and the reason I chose to narrate this story was I really enjoy stories that set you on edge, make you uncomfortable. Um, I like existential stories that make you question things, like the really out there, kind of like weird stories that don't always have an explanation. Uh, those are the stories that I'm really interested in. Not to say I don't like other horror stories, but those are the ones that are my favorite. And when I read this one, it seemed really interesting to do. I was thinking of ways I could narrate it as I was reading it. I thought the best way to read it would be in a half-crazy, half-sensual tone. And it's actually because of this story that a few of my subscribers have asked me to read Erotica. But maybe when I get like 10,000 subscribers or something. This is uh, one of my earlier ones, so this is when I really started working on my pacing, trying to slow down my reading. Let me know what you guys think of this story. This one is called The Body Book. Chewing on glass teaches you a lot about the world. Well, about your own little world at least. It teaches you dignity and indignity. It teaches you tolerance and intolerance. and teaches you the rigors of duality and why you should fully appreciate yourself at the beginning and end of each day. Picking 90s glamour model thin slivers of crystal from your teeth, like the deceived man of back alley streets just wanting a little shuffling rumpty under the salacious cover of night. You start to wonder if this isn't all more than a midnight snack and a great meal of eternity. I can tell you that it is so, so much more. You will start to see yourself in those slivers like tiny fragmented mirrors, seeing yourself reflected back as the figure you truly wish to be. Taller, thinner, stronger, thicker, end, more handsome, sexier, smarter, truly never an end. Devious and cunning. More, well, you. Becoming glass is only a small part of recovery, a small part of what makes me who I am today, as opposed to who I used to be three years ago. It's only one chapter, chapter eight, of the body book. So let me tell you about some others. There's chapter five, muscle mend. You don't know home cooking until you've properly singed off the first few layers of your skin multiple times and left scabs that beg to ooze for weeks to come. Once you get past the skin, though, there's a world of muscle, twisting, bone-white, meaty corpus red like python cords around your slinky little bones. Go ahead and turn on your stove pop. Let it heat up. Wait a few minutes. Lean your world-weary weight via your crotch into the thick edge of the doorknob and with a bath of warm come up to tickle your face. It's like a friendly little neighbor asking to borrow a cup of sugar. The good old days before murder and rape were constants. And the happy little family sat in happy little homes watching their TVs all singing in hollow static voices of the foreign world's atrocities and why we should light them up with the big rockets and send them all to dust. Inhale deeply. There's that sugar sweet smell, the promise of burning hair welled up deep like an infant's fragile fist, pounding whispered gentle against the inside of your nose. Let those tiny fingers rain hard soon, that won't matter. The coils are red hot now, you can hear the deep shifting like tectonic plates in the nightcrumb graveyard before you. The recovering, the artist, the body's author chief of your own. You are the owner of the world's most important body book. You are a sumptuous page turner, the kind where the reader tries to lick their thumb before turning the page and finds themselves overflowing with saliva because your stories are just that good. Chapter 12. I've got my eye on you. That one's a little joke I threw in to give one a smidge of a huff huff ha. 
Now, initiation of the optic nerves into the sequence of our recovery can present some challenges. Unless you're fully ready to give up your gift of shallow sight and see the world for what it truly is, many are not yet there. So don't fret if you'd like to hold on to the shapes and colors that you've held dear from the time you were a child. We'll get to Nikki Nostalgia in chapter 29. If you are not yet there for the supposed loss of shallow sight, then I present you with the following option. Purchase one hypodermic, unopened medical-grade needle. Personally, I prefer the standard U100 insulin syringes due to the shortened needle thinner gauges and a low amount of dead space. Once purchased, I recommend properly disinfecting at home. You never quite know what can happen in transit. Prepare your altar. Prepare your altar with the proper injection grades. See chapter 11. And ready the singing solution. The singing solution will assist you in lessening the shallow sight and the gradual welcome of true sight once filled. Gently insert your needle of choice into the carnucula acrimulus, small meaty bit in the corner of your eye. And allow the singing solution passage into your vessel. Be warned, as the name suggests, you will sing. Oh, you will sing. So very loud and strong that neighboring angels of acrimony may come a-knocking to wonder and press and ask questions that no body book should need to answer. Thus, I recommend removing worry via disintegration. In fact, I recommend this step in the process before you proceed to any of the other chapters. You can read more about disintegration in chapter 2. Let's flip the page back to chapter 5. By now, the stovetop should be screaming with its gentle neon lights, glowing with otherworldly promise. You should feel a deep sense of comfort. You know mother's arms wait to cradle you. You know that she will stroke your cheek and lullaby sweet baby notions to your inner child. You know that her hand reaches out for you, carving a path of love and retribution through the heavy, cookie-baked air of your home. So do not leave her waiting. Reach out and clasp your fleshy fingers into her metal fingers and become one with your hopes and dreams. Press your hand into the stovetop. Thread your greedy digits between the coils and ears that welcome you with shouts of glee. You will, be warned, lose some of your false shell, the skin that you kept so safe from reality. For so many years, you will come to find that it only ever presented you with undue and unwanted change. If you are feeling extra adventurous, press on. There's no need to wait for your first scabbing, your first peeling. The remnants of blood and brittle skin flake off and present you with a shiny new child's ruin with excellence. If you are feeling up to it, begin your first muscle mend. You will feel years of wasted time in your thorough exercises in the stasis of futile, presumptive inertia whip from your flesh, bubbling frame like the winds of your own little apocalypse. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, though. After all, with your hand holding and singing in sweet, sweet lullabies, you are still but a child. You have so much to learn. This is why I've written you this ultimate guide, your destruction manual, your step-by-step step right out the window into the waiting arms of the street lamps and bushes below. Your body book. This is your second puberty. This is your bodily ascension. This is your grave marker you will hold in your hands as you stand tall and proud on the breath of each new day. The tome which you kiss with your crusty lips, droning over with the lies you've led yourself to believe. The new biblical commandments which you take, spin around, and slam into the earth from which you borrowed your sickly vessel in the first place. And proclaim yourself as the world's newest virginal God! This is the first chapter of the rest of your life. This is your introduction to the body book. It's said the true beauty is found on the inside. So, let's take a peek and see what you really look like.
And that story is part of a series, and that's part one, but unfortunately Decomposed hasn't written any more in that series yet. Uh, he's been rather busy with his mobile bookstore, which you guys should check out if you're interested in that. He bought a van and redesigned it as basically a mobile bookstore. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's um, called The Road Virus, and I'll link to that in the description. So if you're interested in checking that out, seeing where he's at, yeah. And this next story is called A Siren Sings Beneath My Skin. I've considered redoing it a few times just because I really like the story and I feel like I could probably do a better job on it now, but yeah, I really like this one. This uh, touches on a few things. It's up to you to really decide what's happening in the story, but I hope you guys enjoy it. A Siren Sings Beneath My Skin by Decomposed There's something living under my skin. The first time it spoke to me, I was five. Its voice was soft, one of gentle guidance. You can climb up that tree, it said. There are treats waiting for you beyond your comprehension. You can climb that tree like a ladder to the stars. More, you can touch your mother's face again. But when I climbed the tree, I found only rotting wood. I found a colony of life besieged by death. The scattered corpses of insect life, a thousand strong, littering every nook and cranny. Lingering in the heart of my eighth summer, just a few days outside of the anniversary of my mother's death, I heard it speak again. This time it was louder. That river isn't too deep. Its surface bubbles, but so do you. Go, enjoy its cool release. Find yourself the smoothest stone and bless its world with the nip at your feet. I awoke to lights flashing red and blue. Worried faces shrouded in white cotton and that of my father gliding close behind. Twisted, enraged, inconsolable, my lungs were an ocean's depth, my skin a shade of blue purer than a rich desert sky. The voice grew stronger in my teenage years, not louder, but more defined, resounding off the angst bred from the commonplace, the slightest unpleasantries, I fostered guilt in the minuscule, the most gentle grievances, and led passive lambs to slaughter. The voice became one of vociferous support in the realm of self-destruction. Every twist and turn, you go too far. You can't see ahead, and you fear what's behind. Skeletons are burying themselves in graves you can't even dig yourself. You're living on borrowed time. Make some room. Cut out a little piece of yourself and prepare your path for regrowth. I did, carving small lines that become blurred over time, references to memories I couldn't recall if they even actually existed in the first place. I sought revelation in capsules and found the word of God in powders of brown and white. I breathed ash, smoked dust, and purged my body of all things right. When I found my first love, in a mess of soft curves, midnight locks and scarlet lips, the supple flesh of my own kind's touch, the voice turned sour and jealous, its needs became stronger and lascivious. You are finding comfort in abomination. You happily bask in the devil's hands and you allow sin to lick greedily from the putrescent kiln of human abstraction. Turn away from her. Turn away from confusion and return your body to the light. Tell her she repulses you. Tell her this was a mistake, and that you would never endeavor to commit such atrocious acts against nature. Tell her. So I did. I broke her heart and mine. And the pieces never able to complement and conform each other. She couldn't take the hurt, 
couldn't face the foe reality I'd created to satiate my phantom's lust. Thus, she took the only thing she could. For years, the voice grew. It steeped into every notion of safety and presented itself to every unfounded decision as the ultimate absolution. Its demands turned from the outside world to within as it rose and pulsed and came to a head. I grew weaker, smaller, transparent. For the last few weeks, I've been able to hear it speaking to me in languages I don't understand. Menace drips from its once dulcet tone. Even if I don't understand a word, tentative licks come buried beneath the flesh, poking and prodding at tensed muscles, testing, searching for signs of entry, the precipice of ovulation. I know what it's doing, what it's looking for. My voice is attempting birth. I haven't actively thought for a single moment about what I'm bound to do, but I know it needs to be done. The voice needs to be silenced. It is louder than my own internal thought process. It is screaming. It knows something is wrong. As I lower the blade into my flesh, right behind my elbow, and I press until it hits the bone with an unexpected clink. The voice doubles, triples in volume. It no longer speaks words, even in foreign tongues. I can feel it pushing against me from the inside, worming fingers between my ribs and begging release. And I will give it just that, release. The meat of my forearm came off easier than expected. As I start on my bicep, a spatter of blood blessing my face with a kiss. The voice reaches a pitch and volume that is unfounded in the natural realm. All I know is that its screams have become unfurnished, shallow, inhuman. I have returned to it the gift that it first gave me. Now, the voice is drowning. As you can probably tell, Decomposed is a very artistic writer. And that's one of the reasons why I love his work. I love the description that he goes into with the tiniest of things and how it sounds so extravagant and just beautiful. And that's one of the things that drew me to his work in the first place. And speaking of how I met Decomposed, uh, that was obviously on No Sleep. I found a few of his works on there and really enjoyed them. Started talking to him. He liked my narrations, and from there we kind of just started working together. And the very first story that I ever contacted him about was his story called Blackwater. If you were to read this story and then read one of his other ones, you wouldn't know they were by the same author. They're very different, but very, very good still. After I asked Decomposed if I could narrate this story, I started practicing my accent because this line or this role calls for more of a southern character and well first off it's a girl second off it's in the south i had to try to imitate a, a little girl from the south uh, that didn't go too well for the first few weeks so i just practiced a lot and then once i felt comfortable with my performance that's when i came out with the video but after asking him I actually narrated like four of his other stories while I worked on this one. So, this one is probably my most time consuming project ever that I've ever worked on. Literally, it took almost a month. Let me know what you guys think of this one. It's called Blackwater. Small town life can be hard. Sometimes you feel downright cut off from the rest of the world. The smallest rumors rocket from the loudest throats and get caught in even the most unwilling of ears. Neighbors all know your every thought, and summers feel like forever, and everything got that unwashed stink of something familiar. Everything seems endless. Simple life can be good, if simple life is all you aim for. Mom always said I aimed high. I was an overachiever. A smart girl gonna go somewhere with 
a big brain. But every time she say that, every time she pay mind to my future, I saw the twinge of pain hidden deep behind her proud eyes, like moss on a night river. Under every word that shone bright on her face, I heard the truth. I'm dark. Mama was blessed with creamy almond skin, but Daddy passed his color on to me. We was the kind of dark that don't hold no light. The kind of dark that no matter how far we come, we always gonna be dark. And Daddy passed when I was a little thing, only eight years. Now I only see his face in shadows. And came up early, started high school when I was just past 13. Mama called me her little flower, her sweet, soft daisy. And before then, she taught me from home, said it was best a mother passed down to her kin the knowledge she'd need for the world. But when she got a factory job and didn't have no more time for me, she gave me to the city. Why are you so black? I kept my eyes on my notebook, trying to block out the words, but they caught up around my heels like hungry dogs on a bone. Sherilyn, let her be. She ain't done nothing to you. I just want to know why she's so dark, all. I traced the words on my paper, like I'd done a hundred times before, ignoring and wishing her away, hard as I could. After a tick, she turned and walked away, her little group pot on her heels. Beneath a curtain of fresh tears, I glanced up, watched her hips sway, mini skirt perched just right and her honey-colored hair bouncing against her back. It's always the same questions. Why are you so black? You get dipped in oil and they forget about you? Your mama lay heavy with the night itself? Always the same smirk, the same accusatory glances glared down from her pixie straight nose like I'd done something to need to answer for it. Always the same words I was used to hearing. That didn't stop them from hurting. Something somewhere deep in me tipped over. Bitch. I muttered, mostly under my breath. It was like I'd screamed it ten times right in her face. Spittle crested on her brow. She whipped around. Honey hair caught in a turbine. It was on me faster than I could breathe out another word. She gripped my collar like it was her best boy's hand and shook me like I was something to dry. The fuck you say to me, you fat lip bitch? She screamed, the heat rising off her skin in spades. I sat with my quiet, knowing any other word just make things worse. She raised a hand to strike and I flinched, expect a rain of blows. Instead, a principal, a round white woman with great ruddy cheeks, came rushing from the back of the hall and caught her hand. Girls, she cried, indignant, there will be absolutely no fighting in my school. Sherilyn tore her hand away and piped up. But Miss Beaker, she, I don't want to hear another word of it. Both of you, detention after school. Now get to class this instant or I'll tack on another day. She spun and marched down the hall, pale yellow pantsuit crinkling with every exaggerated movement. Sherilyn's gaze followed her until she disappeared from sight, then locked in on mine with a hunter's lust, stepping closer to my face till I could see the flare of hate burning clear in her eyes. She grabbed my pinky finger and twisted quick. I yelped, jumping away from her. She stared for another moment then let a smile creep across her face and set a cube of ice between each notch in my spine. She stepped away, mouthing the words, you're fucking dead, and disappeared into the waiting fold of her clan. I was copying my third set of lines, singing a soft tune inside my head. When something hit the back of it, glancing behind me, I saw Cheryl Lynn hiding a snicker behind her palm, cherry red nails dipped into the curve of her cheeks. Her friend Grace sat next to her, looking worried but playing cool. Sherilyn snapped her gum, something the teacher seemed to not notice or just ignore, and rolled her eyes before turning to her lines. I looked on the ground behind my chair and saw a crumpled up piece of paper. Hesitantly, I grabbed it and dropped it on my desk. I didn't want to open it. She probably spit on it or something. And curiosity got the best of me. I unrolled it and laid it open flat on the desk. 
All the air in the room seemed to leap in my throat in that very moment. In blue pen, she'd drawn my death out in tender love and detail. I swung from a tree, stripped bare to my brush suit, and painted with blood and guts from my tore open body. My intestine hung low, almost touching the ground. Big bold X's marked out my eyes, hands shaking. The fires of hate started burning up my stomach walls. I almost didn't hear when the teacher called out to me. Kara. The voice finally broke through my haze. I jumped with a start. Y yes Miss Taff. If you can't pay enough attention to your lines, I can find you something more interesting to do. I looked down at the paper in front of me and crumpled it back up, sticking it in my dress pocket. Sorry, miss. As I finished writing my 23rd line and bled into the 24th, I heard a swell of giggles break out behind me. I ignored them, along with the creeping fear pricking deep at my neck. Autumn was breaking cold against the last legs of summer. And I let the breeze lick hungrily at my face. It had been a hot season, and the kind where you find dogs panting in the dust of the street with nobody come to claim them. I decided to take the long way home, dazzled by bright colors in the last throes of the day. I wasn't paying attention to the path in front of me, like a song from a nightmare. Cheryl Lynn's cold, dry voice crept out from the bush. Oh, look at what we got here. I stopped dead in my tracks, eyes snapping up to meet her. About ten yards ahead, she stood with her friends behind her back. Grace perched nervously off to the side. The hell you want, I said, urging bravery to my voice as it trembled. Look at that. doc has got an attitude problem. She glanced at Grace. Think we can help her tighten that up? Grace looked at me for a tick, then back to Sherlyn. Come on, she's scared enough, let's just go. I looked from face to face, unsure of what to do. I'm just going home. Let me be and I won't bother you no more. Where's the fun in that? She said, stepping forward and pulling a rope from behind her back. I took off running as fast as my legs could carry. Over rocks and logs, I jumped quick as a jackrabbit. Heart pounding my ears like a drum. I heard her barking like a hound at my back, snarling for a kill. As I rounded the corner in a path, I got caught up on an exposed root and stumbled a touch, almost falling over. In that moment, Sherilyn closed the distance between us, I grabbed me by the shoulders, and threw me head first in the nearest tree. The sound of my head cracking against the solid trunk rang throughout the forest like a sick bell. I landed on the ground at its base in a heap, stars prancing in my vision. She kicked me square in the stomach. Rods of hurt bounced off every inch of my insides. She pushed me on my back with her foot and let the length of the rope drop onto my face. She had already fastened the noose. Its thick knot hit me in the eye, forcing it shut with a burst of pain. I tried to back up against the tree and push myself up, but only earned a throbbing jolt of daggers in my arm from where it connected. All I could do was stare up at her through a hazy cloud looking past her triumphal face past Grace's worried sickened one I saw faint light filtering through dense treetops and realized we'd run into the part of the woods adults always forbade us from entering the air seemed to dance between the exposed patches and the waning sun like heat licking off a baked blacktop why why are you doing this I ain't done nothing to you but exist. Just it. And you exist. All a darky like you got to do is exist in this world gone to shit. I ain't done nothing. I began to cry. But she landed a swift blow to my stomach, pitching me forward. She knelt down, balancing on the balls of her feet, put a hand under my chin. Raising it, she smiled, sweet as sugar. Just want to brighten the world up a bit, us all. Unable to move, I sat there, tears streaming down my face in a hot river. She closed the noose around my neck. It felt rough, the rope worn and frayed from years of use. She couldn't have looked happier. Grace just stared on, meek and useless in the background. Without another word, Sherilyn stood up, threw the rope over a branch, and began hoisting me up on my feet. The knot tightened and my neck became stiff. 
cutting off more air with every slight tug. I began to flail, but she conjured a knife from the pocket and held it out. Move much more and I'll have to fucking gut you. Tears stained in my dress. I grasped the rope as good as I could and stood there on my tiptoes, putting as much finger between it and my skin as I could muster. She stood there, devils dancing on her flesh, but she paid them no mind. I was nothing but a shadow to her, nothing but a period at the end of a sentence she'd been reading for far too long. As my vision began to go dark, the world seeping away in a monochrome palette of whites and grays, I saw something move in the trees beyond her head. My eyes bloated and watery, locked on one cluster of leaves in particular. My consciousness was fading fast, but when the leaves parted, I knew it wasn't just the wind. Just as I was losing the last of my sight, the world given to a black cluster, the rope gave way, and I was on the ground sucking air in in heavy gulps. A scream pierced through the veil of darkness around me from a place in the dirt. Trying to make sense of my surroundings, I realized Sherilyn was no longer in front of me. She was above. I scrambled up and got my legs under me, ignoring the pain burning all around. Flailing and kicking like a fox in a trap, she was hovering five feet off the ground, black leather shoes dangling just over my head. She grasped and tore at her throat, but something held her tight. I could see the indents in her skin like somebody was gripping it and squeezing hard. Grace seemed to finally gather her wits and burst forward with a shout, trying desperately to grab her friend from an unseen assailant. She was met with a formless blow and rocketed back into a tree, a skull cracking against the wood, the sound of bone crunching hard as her neck snapped in two. Staring on in rapt wonder, I watched as Cher Lynn's face turned a pretty shade of molten blue, and her attempts got weaker. Her hands, once writhing tigers in a cage, now fluttered uselessly like grounded birds. Sherilyn's eyes, bugged out and glassy, looked down at me, pleading, begging, and they got X'd out. Large, black wounds opened up over them like paper shredding, and even through the invisible vice around her throat, I could hear her screaming. It sounded like frantic, garbled static, her body convulsed. It seemed to throb all at once like every vein in it was working overtime. In one swift motion, her clothes came tearing off, exposing soft, lily-white flesh to the gentle air of the forest. It was like a drawn, enraptured. I knew what was coming next. I stepped forward and raised my face up higher. Smiling proud as I could to welcome the coming rain. As if taking my cue, her stomach throbbed once, twice, then ruptured like it held a tiny grenade, sending a spray of blood down upon me and coating the shag carpet of leaves beneath in a fine sheen. Unfurling like a snake ready to strike, her guts came pouring out of her, formed into a pile around my feet. Her body was now a ragged mess of beautiful, violet colors. Coming to life, her intestines picked up and began running through the air like they was on a track, coiling around her limbs and over her skin, savoring every inch. They looped around her throat and I saw the indents disappear, wrapping around the branch that she tried to put me up on. The slimy coil tied itself off in a pretty little knot, and suddenly, it was done. I looked around, realizing the force had gone stock, still and silent. The air hummed with their deaths, and I could feel the heat shimmering around me, pushing out the natural cool of the night. Reaching out a hand, I saw and felt nothing. However, after a few inches of searching, I met something warm, solid, and pulsing with life. And I felt it close around my fingers in an inviting embrace, beckoned by the closing light. Sherilyn's ruined corpse swung with a marionette's twisted grace, still painting the brush below pretty little patterns. 
Somewhere deep in the forest, a stream bubbled softly, water running thick and black. As the night began to swallow us up, I hope you guys enjoyed that one. I wasn't exactly sure how well I did the accent, but I think I did okay. What do you guys think? Now, as you guys know, I write my own music and I do my own sound effects. So that song that I, or that guitar song you heard at the end is uh, called just Blackwater. And I think that's available on Spotify. I'm not sure. I'm going to be uploading a new album soon with a bunch of my new music. I'm not sure if uh, that current album has Blackwater, but if you want to hear any of my music, you can check me out on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or you can just go to my Patreon page and listen to the music there also. This next story is a longer one. This one took me a while to do just because uh, I, I really wanted to do a lot with sound design. Yeah, this one took me about two weeks, I think. This, I think this story by itself is around 40 minutes, so be prepared for that. So go to the bathroom now, because I swear to God, if you pause this in the middle of it and go to the bathroom, I will be in the stall. Yeah, think about that. Dress me like a clown. Unless you live under a rock, you no doubt have seen the rash of stories about crazed clowns on the loose, terrorizing people, and generally sending the U.S. into an upheaval. This isn't a story about one of those clowns. This is a story about my childhood friend, Mr. Pogo, and how he helped me through one of the most tumultuous periods of my life. The day I met Mr. Pogo, it was my best friend Maisie's ninth birthday party. The most I can remember is colors. It was the first time I'd ever seen them. I've always been a very visual person, but for the first eight years of my life, I only saw the world in shades of black, white, and gray. I was diagnosed with color blindness when I was five just after starting kindergarten. It didn't affect me much. When you don't know something, you can't really miss it. Macy's parents had gone all out this year. They invited our whole grade from school. and got a massive cake, pony rides, and even a clown. When I asked my dad, he agreed to bring me. Albeit, somewhat begrudgingly, dad didn't like to leave the house a whole lot anymore. Ever since mom had left a few months ago, and he lost his job, He'd changed. Now, he was always tired, always drinking, and not just a beer with dinner anymore. He was always angry, blurry-eyed, sour. He was hurting. On the way to the party, we were both silent. The radio droned on in the background, and I fidgeted nervously in my seat, watching gray shadows flip past the window. In a blur of same-looking shapes, I sighed deeply and could clearly hear Dad's hands tightening against the leather covering the steering wheel. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw his white-knuckled grip, the tensity of his jaw, the heat radiating off him was something I could almost feel. I dropped my chin to my chest and absently brushed a hand against the deep bruise that blossomed overnight on my shoulder. It hurt. I winced. I didn't make another sound the rest of the drive. The second I saw Maisie, she ran up and jumped me with a big hug. I tried as hard as I could not to yelp, biting my lip, but a whimper still managed to slip out under my breath. She instantly backed off, worry flooding her eyes. I shifted my weight and could feel her gaze roving my body. It instinctively stopped on my shoulder and she gave me the same look she always did. We're only kids, but... She was still smart beyond her years. And she knew. We sang happy birthday. Maisie opened her presents. I'd gotten her with help from my dad. The newest Polly Pocket dream house. Those things were all the rage back then. And we all stuffed our faces with cake. Then Mr. Pogo came on. And I felt the entire world shift. From somewhere I couldn't pinpoint. Music started to gently bleat. A deep, crunchy calliope sounding like it was being filtered 
through an echo chamber. I whipped around, trying to make sense of the direction. Suddenly, as if from thin air, a figure in a brightly colored costume somersaulted into view and jumped up with a small pop. I thought my eyes were on fire. I thought the world was ending. I didn't know exactly what I was seeing, but I knew it was color. A flurry of alien shapes exploded across my vision. I somehow knew all their names. With my breath caught in my throat, I watched the strange man dance in a wide circle across the grass, tapping kids on the head with a felt flower, yellow and green. His wide-legged pants, red, blue, white, gently flapping in the wind. Bells, golden and silver, threaded into them and jingled softly. The calliope music swelled louder and louder. I felt like I was caught in a merry-go-round of sound and light. The man pulled a handful of long, thin balloons, a veritable rainbow, out of his pocket, red, and began inflating them, twisting them into animals of all shapes and sizes. Blue dolphins, red birds, yellow giraffes rained down on us, and we all clapped in wonder. But for the first time, I tore my eyes away from the clown and looked around me, expecting to see a brand new world, and was shocked to find that beyond him, or what he was touching, my newfound colors disappeared. It was as though there was some phantom vacuum waiting hungry and greedy, licking them up as soon as they left his body. He flipped by me, greasing Maisie's arm with one white-gloved finger, and for a second, I saw that her dress lit up with a bright blue. Her eyes widened, cradling a soft brown. For the rest of his performance, I sat, entranced, watching the traces of color sing across Maisie's backyard, following the clown wherever he went. Then, he was done. He left. And the colors left with him. Disappointed and reeling just the slightest, I decided to take a short walk to the back of the house while Macy's mom set up a party game. The forest that fed into the yard was vast and thick, and I'd spent quite a few lazy summer days camped out there, swapping dumb jokes and ghost stories with my friend. As I reached the edge of the tree line, I heard a faint, familiar jingling sound. The clown stood about ten feet behind me, and the colors had returned, swirling through his clothes, bouncing back and forth on his heels. He reached into his pocket and produced another balloon. And this one was purple. He floated over to me, inflating it and twisting it as he went, and offered it to me, fully formed. A small figure sat on his palms. It looked like a child curled up, its arms over its face. Unsure of what to say, I took the gift and stared into his eyes. They were black. Not just the pupil, but the iris as well. Underneath them, large red fans made up the curve of his cheek, dotted with a yellow scatter of stars. Finally, I managed to stammer out a quiet, Thank you. A flourish of the hand responded. I watched as it curved and dipped in the air, making its way closer to me. I felt frozen, not by fear, but rather by the sense of comfort I hadn't felt in a long time. I felt warm as the gloved hand came to rest on my shirt. I knew I should run. I knew I should shout for an adult. And everything in me screamed go, remembering the safety lessons they taught us at school. Stranger Danger PSAs flashed through my head, like massive billboards. But something told them to hush, that this was all right. I moved my collar aside, revealing a galaxy of bruises. Not just the fresh ones from last night, but the littered remnants of their cousins from the last few months. I looked down, and for the first time, saw my own colors. Splotchy purple. Fresh, sickly yellow. I felt disgusting. I took a step backwards and stumbled, landing in the dirt. His hand fluttered away, up to his mouth, and covered it with a dramatic flare. I blinked, and he was suddenly standing over me, hand outstretched. Hesitantly, I took it, 
and felt something cold and hard touch my fingers. He pulled me up, leaving the object in my hand, and made a show of brushing my shirt off, doing a dance in a tight circle before turning and bounding away. In my palm sat a small metal buzzer, the kind you would get in a joke shop to shock people with. As he disappeared around the corner of the house, the world going gray once more, I could hear my dad calling for me. He sounded upset. Without thinking, I shoved the buzzer into my pocket, feeling the hard metal kiss of my skin through the fabric of my pants, and ran back to the front of the house. The rest of the party was fun, filled with games and dancing, but I couldn't stop thinking about the strange clown and his gift. That night was worse than usual. I think the energy of the day was too much for Dad. By dinner, he had already sunk himself into his fourth bottle of nasty-smelling beer and was slurring his words as he told me just to throw something in the microwave. I watched the cheese in my hot pocket bubble, closing my eyes and silently wishing myself elsewhere. The microwave beeped three times, and Dad called for me to bring him another beer. I obliged as I rounded the corner into the living room where he was watching TV, shoes propped up on the trash-covered table. I tripped on the carpet, sending the beer bottle flying. The foamy liquid splattered on the carpet. What the fuck is wrong with you? He shouted, jumping up and knocking over his empty bottles. He crossed the room, grabbing at my collar and hoisting me off the ground until my toes were dangling. Little fucking idiot. He spat in my face. I started crying, tears pouring freely. That just made him angrier, thinking he was going to hit me. I braced for the impact, only to be dropped back to the floor. Through the tears, his face was dark and shadowed. Placing a hand on my bruised shoulder, he dug his thumb into it. I yelped, trying to pull away, but he kept pressing harder and harder until I thought it would snap. I wanted to hit him, but I knew that would be a death sentence. Just when I thought I might black out from the pain, and he released me, shoving me away from him. I hit the wall and slumped down, landing in a wet spot from the spilled bottle. Without another word, he stormed away down the hall, slamming the door to his bedroom. In between hitched sobs, I heard the microwave beep again, reminding me of my hot pocket. I picked myself off the ground, tugging at my stretched shirt and rubbing my sore shoulder and made my way into the kitchen. No longer hungry, I tossed the food in the trash and went to my room. Why? I thought to myself. Why did he have to hurt me? Does he not love me anymore? I didn't leave. Mom did. The same tired jumble of thoughts I'd returned to over and over again since his anger turned outward ran through my head. I flopped onto the bed, exhausted, and rolled over, hiding my face in the pillow. Something hard bit into my leg, and I remembered the buzzer. I took it out of my pocket. There didn't seem to anything special about it. Turning it over my palm, I noticed the inscription on the back, set into the sleek metal surface. The name Mr. Pogo was embedded in a thick, flowery script. Why had he given it to me? I wiped my wet face with the back of my hand. On the front, it had a little nub poking from the center, the part that you're supposed to touch to your victim's palm without thinking. And I pressed it, expecting a little shock. From the belly of the house, a deep bellow exploded. I could hear a muffled, What the fuck? being shouted, my dad's voice. Staring at the buzzer, I contemplated it for a moment. It had to be a weird coincidence, right? The pad of my finger lingered on the metal stick, and I pressed it down again. A static shock crackled in the air, and I could almost see my dad jumping in his bed, flinging the sheets off him and pounding the bedside table as he drunkenly screamed in pain. With confusing visions of power dancing in my head, I slept safe and sound that night in the comfort of the buzzer.
And the next morning, I sat at the table with a bowl of cereal and a piece of slightly burnt toast. I silently watched as Dad poured himself a cup of coffee and rubbed his head. Bleary, shadowed eyes. He looked like he hadn't slept in a wink, and the hangover clung to him like a petulant child. I grinned into my spoon. All day, through the white noise of my teacher's words, all I could think about was the buzzer and Mr. Pogo. At least, I assumed that was his name. The strange clown had given me a gift, but why? How had he known, and why did he care? Questions breezed through my mind like frantic birds throughout the rest of the day. As the bell signifying the end of school rang, I panicked and packed up my things and headed to the door with memories of his bright colors running rampant in my head. As soon as I got home, I ran into my room, throwing myself onto my bed and grabbing the buzzer from underneath my pillow. There had to be more to it. I turned it over and over in my hands, looking for some secret sign, some tell to its magic, but only saw stainless steel and my new friend's name. I went to sleep early that night. As I drifted off, I could have sworn I heard bells jingling against the curve of the wind. Over the course of the next two weeks, little gifts started to appear in odd places. A silky pair of red and white pants and a frilly shirt under my bed, a plastic jar of white, creamy paste in my closet, and a small blue and yellow hat with a shiny golden bell on it hanging from the bedside lamp. I wasn't worried, and I didn't tell Dad about any of them. I knew it was just Mr. Pogo, trying to tell me that he was watching, that he would keep me safe. Better yet, I could see the colors in all of his gifts. Dad only acted up once during that time, when I forgot to close the door to the backyard. I earned a shiny new bruise on my stomach, and the loss of the air in my lungs for that one. Lying in bed, curled up in pain, I grabbed for my buzzer and held down on it for a little longer than I probably should have. Dad's screams ricocheted off the walls, sending chills of excitement creeping up my spine. The next day, I could hear him muttering about the doctors, strokes, and all sorts of other words I didn't really care about. On my way home, I could think of nothing but what new present I might unearth that night. The gifts were erratic, but they were always wonderful. The second I walked through the door, I knew something was wrong. My dad's shoes were in the hallway. He was home. Usually he didn't arrive home from wherever he went during the day until at least an hour or two after I got back from school. Dad? I called out, tentatively. Silence greeted me as I walked through the dark front hall. He wasn't in the living room, not in the kitchen. The door to his bedroom was closed without any light showing from underneath it. I shrugged and went to my room, but stopped dead in my tracks when I saw there was clearly a light on inside. I called out again. Dad, are you here? My voice sounded small, nervous. I turned the knob and pushed the door in. It was sitting on my bed, the red silky fabric of my special pants showing through his clenched fists. He looked up at me with an expression I'd never seen crawling across his face and said, in a low, husky voice, You been dressing up, boy? I shook my head, unsure of what to say. Found this. Thought you could hide it. <gasps> he hiccuped. Thought you could hide this faggot shit from me. Dad, I found your makeup, too. What you need makeup for? I'm gonna go suck some cock at school like a pretty boy? Hmm, that it? He hurled the plastic jar towards me, hitting the door frame. It bounced off with a loud thud and rolled across the carpet, stopping near the window. The sky outside was dark, like a cavernous mouth. It had started to rain, and the world was simply yawning in deep, stormy breaths, and I heard faint jingling. Standing up, bracing himself on the headboard, and knocking my bedside lamp to the floor. He stumbled forward, 
grabbing for me. I could smell the booze on him. It hit me in the face like a rank cloud. I didn't give him time to reach me, dashing out the door. I slipped around the corner and ran through the hallway, stopping at the entrance to see if he was following, heart pounding in my ears. I could clearly hear his footsteps thundering behind me. I burst through the living room, around the island in the kitchen, and doubled back into the hallway. Reaching my bedroom door, just as he realized where I was, I managed to get the door closed and locked, pressing my back against it as he returned, huffing and puffing, full of rage. He slammed a fist into it, shouting, Open this fucking door! And the wood flexed against me, but held fast. The storm is raging past my window now. I could see the trees in our backyard whipping back and forth in the wind, and a sheet of rain splattered against the window. A bolt of lightning shot across the sky, and I saw, for just a brief moment, a bright white face in the window. It was my friend, Mr. Pogo, come to help. I ran to the window, wrenching it open, as Dad pounded harder and harder against the door and shouted something unintangible into the roar of the outside world. Another bolt, and I saw that Mr. Pogo was gone. I shouted for him again, and then heard a loud jingling behind me. Spinning in place, I saw him, perfectly dry, dressed just the way he'd been at Maisie's party. He bounced up and down on his heels, spreading his arms wide. I ran to him and jumped up, snuggling into his embrace. He smelled like old books and sweet flowers and cotton candy. He held me tight for just a moment, and then set me down. Mr. Pogo, I'm scared. He placed a long finger against my lips and gestured around us in a circle. I, I don't understand. Dad howled in the background, beating his fist raw against the door. It was beginning to splinter, small cracking noises punctuating the more methodic ones from outside. Mr. Pogo reached deep in his pocket and produced a flower with a long string attached to it. On the other end, there was a small pad with a button. He pinned the flower to my shirt and placed the button in my hand, closing my fingers around it. Jumping up, he flounced over to the window and plucked the jar of makeup up from where it had landed. He unscrewed it, coating his hand, and crossed back over to me. His feet didn't touch the ground as they moved. Quickly and gently, he spread the cold paste across my face. It smelled like the type of medicine my grandpa used to rub on his knees and back. And like, like something else. Licorice, maybe? He snatched up my pretty clothes, my shirt and pants, and helped me into them. Just as it sounded like the door was about to snap in half under the weight of my dad's anger, Mr. Pogo placed a little hat on my head, pulling it down snug, and flicked the bell with his finger. And it jingled. I giggled. I knew what I had to do. I had to show Dad that the world wasn't all scares and frights. We could laugh and have fun again. I grabbed up my buzzer and hopped over to the door. Looking back at Mr. Pogo, he gave me the OK sign with his hand, fingers seeming just a bit longer and thinner than usual, and winked. The movement was exaggerated, and as he opened his mouth, I saw that he had no teeth. Just a bright, blood-red tongue and gaping blackness leading into his throat. The walls of my room glowed a faint neon green around me as I gripped the doorknob, giving him a silent, open-mouthed giggle and unlocked the door. It opened. My dad spilled into the room, slamming into the opposite wall. What the fuck is wrong with you, you little piece of shit? He stopped mid-sentence as he looked behind me. Silly me. I, I would have introduced them. Uh, who? Who? What? He began, but his mutterings were drowned out by the music, as though I had my very own carnival chorus. The sound of the majestic calliope spilled into the room, reverberating off every available surface. It filled the air, which was crackling with the scent of freshly made popcorn and peanuts and candied lights, and I felt new life flow into me. I must show Dad my new tricks. I bound over him, chucked him under his chin, and bopped him on the nose. He stared, mouth agape, at the dancing wonder his son had become. Bending forward, I gestured to my flower. He blinked a few times, 
then leaned forward to inspect it, letting another silent giggle slip through my body, with the one hand over my mouth and the other gripping the button at the end of my string. I pressed down. A jet of wonderful smelling liquid sprayed out of it, coating Dad's face. The second it made contact, he started clawing at it with his fingers, screaming with all his might. I knew my show was off to a good start. I glanced behind me. Mr. Pogo was clapping. The spindly stalks of his eyes bulging through the red, glossy caverns of his torn, open cheeks. Hopping from foot to foot, he clicked his razor-sharp claws together, leant back his head and crowed. It was the first time I'd heard him make an actual sound. It was magnificent. I crowed alongside him, the sound swelling and pulsing in between blasts of the churning organ. Then, I remembered my buzzer. I looked down on Dad, writhing and squirming, his face melting from his skin in festering ribbons, the muscles of his cheeks bubbling and bursting, sending sprays of green and orange and red all over the floor, and I pressed the button. How he convulsed. I pressed it again, watching him dance and jump in the air like a marionette. I, the gracious puppet master, held it down and watched his legs scramble and jolt in a frantic blur, wanting to give my doll a proper send-off. He clawed backwards up the wall, propelled by my electric magnet, and clawed wildly at the doorframe. Trying to pull himself from the room, I could see most of the bone of his face now. His skin glinted, twinkling like a diamond from the outside, as the rest of his skin started to singe, parts of it popping under his clothes like wet popcorn at the fair. I jumped up and down spinning and twirling, punching the button of my buzzer to the rhythm of my dance, with one final scream rippling through him like a siren. Dad's feet lifted on the floor entirely. He hovered in the air for just a moment, his bones seeming to vibrate right out of his body, and a sound like meat packing against the concrete tore through the house, and his body popped like a balloon. I jumped back grabbing Mr. Pogo's claws, and they dug into my fingers. But I didn't mind. The steaming remnants of Dad falling around us like a mucusy rain, birthing a set of new legs from the twitching black shell of his torso, Mr. Pogo tossed me onto his back. I settled in comfortably, and he skittered forward, stepping over Dad's ruined corpse, out the window, and dropped into the yard below. The storm screamed on around us as we danced into the night, skipping, pirouetting, and whirling gracefully through the raindrops. Two clowns looking for a brand new party. I hope you guys enjoyed that one. Let me know what you think about Clowns. With the new It movie coming out, I'm super excited for that. I watched the uh, original one, well, the one in the 90s when I was a kid, and it um, made me pretty afraid of the dark for a good 10 years. But one of my favorite movies, so I really hope the new one's good. The n this next story is called Bath Time in the Ocean of Dreams. And this one is... Uh, definitely more obscure in its meaning. I think I have an idea of what it is, like what happens and what's, what the story means, but I'm not gonna like ruin it for anybody. Uh, it's I, I like decompose stories because depending on who you are as a person, it can mean something entirely different, so. This was one of my first narrations, so you might notice that the quality isn't as good. I, when I started off, I had a different microphone. I have touched up these audio files for this video, but there's only so much I can do, so I hope you enjoy it. I love baths. Usually daddy helps me, but I like it more when he leaves me be. Well, to my own world, swimming with my favorite creatures in the deep white and blue sea. Down in the tub, I can imagine myself dipping and diving with dolphins, riding along on a seal's furry slick back weaving in and out of coral reefs and just being free. Sometimes I like to hold my breath and challenge myself and I'm getting bigger and stronger as I get older. I can hold my breath for a whole minute now. And tonight I took a big breath and dove down to the bottom of the ocean floor. On the way, I said hello to all sorts of creatures swimming in big wide circles. 
I hit the bottom and spread myself out like a starfish, my little curling arms reaching across the white sheet of sand. I stayed like that, a good, gentle starfish, happy, waving, stretching. And I saw a shark come, slipping out of the shadows. The shark is a mean creature, it likes to nip at my toes and whisper bad things in my ears. One time, it bit me so hard that I actually bled. The little droplets drifted through the water like tiny red clouds. I could push my fingers through. This time, the shark dove straight for my thighs. He sank his big white teeth and I screamed into the water, the shock bubbling out of me in a big wave. I thrashed and thrashed, kicking, trying to get away, but he held on tight. I grasped at my breath, like a slippery fish that was trying to get away, and I started to get the slightest bit sleepy. My head filled with light, and I gulped down streams of water. Then I floated up. My body swam on its own. I circled up through the wondrous reefs, saying hello to all my friends. My shrimps and dolphins, seals and whales, and they all watched me, silent, as I broke the surface of the ocean and floated up to touch the bathroom ceiling. The light in the middle flickered as I came near. Though I was still wet, not a single drop fell from me. I looked down and saw Daddy. He looked frightened. His shirt was wet and his eyes bugged out like two hard-boiled eggs in his head. He was splashing away in my deep blue sea tugging at something that looked an awful lot like me. It couldn't be, though, because here I was, in the biggest ocean of them all. Her eyes were open, wide as the sea floor, and I could see little spidery cracks of red in them, like wriggling anemones. Her lips were fat and blue, and she looked scared and frozen. I wish I could help her, but I was having far too much fun, swimming in the new ocean that had opened up before me. The song I composed for that one is called Into the Ocean, which is also available on Spotify if any of you want to listen to it. Normally with each story that I do, I compose a unique theme song just for that story. And I have a lot. I have probably like five or six albums worth at this point. I just haven't gotten around to uploading all of them. But I hope you guys are enjoying this video so far. Make sure to let me know what you think. Um, I have been working on this for about, about two weeks, going through and re, uh, remastering all of the old audio tracks, trying to get them to match, make it so that they don't sound ear-piercingly horrible, and all that, you know. So uh, if you guys like it, let me know. I'll spend more time on some other videos like this, as well as, well as my Riders of Horror series, which um, I need to, f uh, I'll have part one coming out pretty soon here, whenever I stop just getting plowed by my work and their fucked up schedule. Literally, they don't, they tell me the day of if I work that day. Wait, I got off topic. Okay, anyway, so this next story, is uh, called Hoodening, and the theme song I wrote for this one actually became one of my most popular songs. It's called Reborn, and so if any of you have heard my song Reborn but haven't heard the story that I wrote it for, that's this one. So and this this one again is one of my first ones. So the audio quality may be a bit different, but I hope you enjoy it. Hoodening. It was on the eve of the great lord's birth that we were felled by the corpulent weight of our own fury's wrath. Twilight had fallen, and festivities were just starting. By some act of a righteous, benevolent god, I had been chosen as this year's leader for the hoodening, the annual Yule Parade of our sacred cloaked equine. The creature we'd crafted this year was a right sight, a massive gaping maw, big marbled eyes, and a coat as long as I'd ever seen. Things have been difficult in the town as of late. The disappearances had shaken everyone from the slumber of safety, and a fine dusting of tension had been laying across the lungs of every man, woman, and child. It had started with Allison Harper, quietly playing in the street by her house one moment, gone the next, leaving a screaming mother in her wake. Then, two days later, 
the young Brevior twins were out walking by the pond, just a mile past their house, and by nightfall, no one had heard from them. None of the three children were seen again, but on the week's anniversary of their disappearances, a small token appeared on the doorstep of their family homes. For Allison, an interwoven blackberry bramble. For the twins, a thick silver chain. No one could decipher their meaning, and no one had any clue as to the origin of their sudden departure. In the last two months, a half dozen more children have been lost, sucked into the wind without a trace. At first, the entire town was in a full-on panic, then, as if by some grand mystic hand's wave, a hush fell and it became the norm, almost accepted, almost expected. Any families with children under the age of 13, it seemed as though the phantom's lustful malice stopped there, went on complete lockdown, chaperoning wherever they went, moving as a unit. But even that didn't stop it. Surely the disappearances thinned in volume, but they still happened, regardless of any precaution taken. Then, a little bit of the mystery broke. Someone misstepped and the shroud slipped just enough to get a semblance of an answer. In the investigation of a fifth child taken, an eight-year-old boy named Charles Meadow, a policeman had accidentally uncovered a secret hatch in the boy's bedroom. Within the hatch, they found evidence of suffering, of extended captivity, and other things I dare not think of, let alone repeat out loud. Needless to say, his parents were brought in for questioning, and subsequently arrested. This news shook the town, but it also dropped a suggestive veil over the remaining disappearances. What were they hiding? What terrors had these families wrought on their own kin? Like an unfolding fan, the horrendous secrets came to light one by one. Of the nine total children taken, every single one was found to have been the victim of some unbelievable atrocity perpetrated by the parents. Arrests were all made, but no matter how hard any of the parents were interrogated, they never gave up information related to the potential whereabouts of the children. Eventually, with a path full of dead ends, the cases were dropped, and the parents were left to rot in their respective cells. Through all of this pain, through the collective torment and turmoil, I have remained silent. I haven't uttered a single word, not about the locations of the children, and not about the things that the great wooden beast whispers to me at night. But when I took my daughter's life, placing her favorite pink and white lace pillow over her face as she slept, I had nothing but sorrow in my heart. I didn't know its purpose back then, but I now realize that I was meant to commit to a higher cause, to herald in the new age for our community and cleanse our crimes through the compassionate breath of fire. The rest of the men in the hooding party assisted me to the town center, carrying our steed with pride. They knew nothing of what was to come, and wouldn't understand if they did. As the late taste of light falls behind the treetops, the darkness in our hearts will outweigh any shadows the night may bring and we will be shown for what we truly are. Thus, now, I stand on the edge of the circle. The flames lick hungrily and greedily at the soot-blackened feet of my neighbors, and they sing, sing, sing into the night sky. A great horse rears its head, its whinny a valiant roar, and blares our truths into the screaming vortex. We are reborn. All right, this next one is a bit long. This one is about, I think it's almost an hour long. Damn. Uh, this one is called Hangnail. This one is definitely um, uh, gr gruesome. <laughs> yes. yes, I hope you enjoy it. It started with a hangnail. I'd always been a fan of picking it myself. Acne, blisters, scabs, you name it. I'd sit there, unconsciously, toying with it for hours. I have a relatively fair complexion, so many trips to the beach as a child would, if we were lucky, result in hours of entertainment. 
Sometimes, I could even get entire parts of my body to peel without breaking the seal. When I hit 15, I started to get pretty bad eczema on the backs of my hands and scalp. My parents began to notice the scratching. I started to see the flakes I'd leave on my pillow. Mom got me a special shampoo, some dark blue sulfur smelling stuff that somehow reminded me of the river of Hades. It was supposed to work wonders, but oh, I don't want that. I'd pour a nickel sized drop on my hand and rub it along the edge of my hairline, lathering it just enough to get the scent on me in case she chose to smell me. I'd let the mounds of dried skin build up for days and then absolutely go to town. <laughs> that was always my favorite. Sometimes, moving slowly and carefully, I'd be able to extract entire inch-wide chunks from the desiccated follicles, little bits of blood flanking the pale grays and whites. I almost felt like an artist. It all turned for the worse a few months later, in Mr. Robertson's English class. He had been droning on about Baudelaire for ten minutes, his usual fare, and I had been working on a sizable chunk. Sometimes, it would burn as my fingernails dug into my scalp, but it all added to the experience. I leant my head into my palms and went crazy, scratching my nails in my favorite crisscross pattern. I was in bliss. Back and forth I raked, imagining waves crashing into each other in a harmonious swell. I don't know how long I drifted off for, but the scream which pierced my veil of pleasure was loud enough that I almost fell out of my desk. Reeling, I glanced around and realized the entire class was staring at me. Casey, the short brunette who sat behind me, was dry heaving. I slowly brought my hand around to my desk to find that they were drenched in blood. Chunks of scalp poking out from under my nails. The entire back of my head was on fire. Mr. Richardson didn't know what to do. He just sent me to the office. My parents were called, and that's when everything changed. When small warning signs were apparently hoisted into huge red flags. That's the day I started seeing Dr. Cipher. He was calm, calculating, collected. He assured me everything I was doing to myself could be healed, both physically and mentally, with time, patience, and diligence. All we needed to do was flesh things out, go deeper, past the surface, and extract what was festering underneath, and fostering this pain. With his long fingers, ending in neatly manicured nails folded under his chin, bereft of a single hair, he was the picture of poised perfection, someone to trust. He smelled of old leather and something deeper, something of the earth. Our first few sessions went fine. He explored my basic interests, activities I liked, and how I was feeling about myself on a day-to-day -day basis. He even shared a few tidbits of his own life with me, his favorite movies. We both loved the classics. A fun memory of a barbecue he and his wife had hosted last 4th of July. Good, simple things. During my sixth session, things changed. I remember waking up that day feeling particularly good. I felt good about myself. And not in a way that was brought on by my favorite hobby. In the previous sessions, we'd worked out the realization that this obsessive habit wasn't truly making me happy and only diverting my attention from the depression and anxiety I'd suffered from as long as I could remember. Over the course of those two weeks, I found myself picking and pulling and peeling less and less. Some of the wounds even started to scab over and show signs of healing. Scabbing would always be the best part. It was like getting two for the price of one. This time, I just watched the skin grow. And reform. I woke up that day, slipped on my favorite red sundress, and actually took the time to apply a little makeup. A sickly looking girl stared back at me from the spotty mirror. I absent mindedly brought a hand up to my pock marked face and brushed a strand of hair behind my ear. Dr. Cipher had said I was a beautiful young woman, 
and again, time and patience could heal most of my wounds. The way he made me feel with this simple yet, the way he made me feel with his simple yet obviously sincere words was something I'd never experienced before. Stepping into the office annex and nodding a hello to Amy at the at reception, I sat down and began going over last session's notes. Dr. Cipher always had me copy down what my goals were for the last session, whether it be overcoming some new obstacle or simply keeping up progress. I set my hands on my lap and stared at them, left hand, index finger, a lovely little hangnail. I could feel my eye twitching, so I started cracking my knuckles. I mainly wanted to stop picking at my cuticles. My nail beds were practically destroyed from years of nervous repetition. All I wanted was to get better, to be able to paint my nails and do my hair and a little bit of makeup and be a tiny bit more effortlessly pretty like the other girls. I could get there. I knew it. I glanced at the clock. Eight minutes until my appointment started. I liked being punctual, and since the third session, Mom started letting me catch the bus downtown by myself. She said she was proud of me. She trusted me. The door swung open, and my savior stood there, a warm, inviting figure of health and safety. I brushed past him, and he patted me on my shoulder like he always did. This time, he didn't let go. I stopped abruptly and looked up into calm, dark brown eyes. He simply smiled and closed the door. He led me over to a familiar red leather couch and sat down with me. His other hand appeared on my knee, just below the hem of my dress. The bright red, offset by the pale white of his skin. My heart crept into my throat. My mouth went suddenly dry. Today, we're going to try something new said Dr. Cipher, and I blinked. You've been doing so well for the past few sessions, and I thought we'd move on to the next part of the course I've been working on. I began to speak, then shut my mouth. I felt slightly uncomfortable, but admittedly pretty excited. He must have sensed the unsureness in my face, or the hesitation in my body, because the hand resting on my thigh gave the slightest of rubs. It sent electric waves rolling towards the center of my body, and I could feel myself flush. I took a deep breath and murmured, I've I felt so good over the past few weeks. Anything I can do to feel better? Anything you want? He let go of my shoulder, took his hand off my knee, and stood up, walking over to his desk. Opening the top drawer, he took out a thin black magazine-sized box with gold trim and set it on a pile of invoices. With a tap of his index and middle fingers, he turned to me and smiled, first with his eyes, and then his mouth. This is going to be your new diary. I'd always loved diaries. I'd filled out dozens since I was about ten years old, and could spend hours recounting the woes of the day. Coincidentally, I was just about to run out of space in my current one. Without hesitation, I stood up and paced over to the desk, picked up the box, and excitedly flipped it open. A red velvet slip with a similarly gold string greeted me. And this was one of the nicest gifts anyone had ever gotten me. I pulled at the string, wondering if the beauty of the book would match its container. To this day, I will never forget the feeling of my stomach slipping out of my corporeal form and slamming into the ground. What greeted me was not the diary I thought it would be. Gorgeous stainless steel glinted sharply in the dim but warm light of the office. Hooks and barbs intertwined over crocodile teeth pliers. Tiny, monstrous mouths. My mind was reeling. What did this mean? How was this my new diary? I raised my eyes to Dr. Cipher's placid face, poring over it, looking for a hint of anything telltale I could latch onto. There was nothing there but the same caring expression he'd always carried in my presence. What is this? I asked. A simple question, but all I could muster. Through the warmth of his smile, he returned. Like I said, your new diary. I know you've been keeping notes of all of our sessions. 
There's only so much that words can do to help heal. I like to take a more practical approach with some of my special clients. And you, Charlotte, are very special. His eyes flicked back down to the box. Ten beautiful and extremely sharp-looking tools set in perfectly formed divots. A dark burgundy background hugging them in neat rows. The majority were blades of varying sizes. From a small scalpel with a black rubber base to a larger serrated knife, the latter had a dark red jewel set in the handle. Most likely a ruby. To its right sat a playing card sized sheet of metal with slightly raised pinprick holes. It looked like a cheese grater. At the bottom, the longest of the lot, a pair of what looked like eyelash curlers lay parallel to each other, one slightly more curved and sharp at the edge than the others. The last was a normal pair of pliers, the type you would find in a tool chest, save for the intricate white and gold inlay set in the handle. In the dead center of the box, a jewel that matched the one in the largest knife sat surrounded by a simple black border. Entranced by the simplicity and elegance of the tools before me, I jumped a bit when Dr. Cipher spoke next. I'd like to start you on a new program called Regression Therapy. Coming back to reality, I tore my eyes away from the box and frowned. My parents can barely afford the sessions we have right now, and I go to public school, so it's not like they can help. He held up a hand. There'll be no change in cost. In fact, it would be better if your parents didn't know about the new course, as it's been proven most effective when it's entirely personal and confidential for the patient. Alarm bells went off in my head. After school PSAs and endless warnings from my parents and teachers and other adults bouncing off each other. That familiar childhood warning of stranger danger, of the secret promises. Simultaneously, a growing warmth began spreading in my stomach and up my chest at the thought of having a secret to share with Dr. Cipher, not to mention those tools. There's just something so incredibly attractive about them. What am I supposed to do with them? I asked. The exact same thing you were doing before, just more effectively, more comfortably. I gulped, my mind racing back to my days of picking and peeling, scratching and cutting. I thought I was supposed to stop. That's why I'm here. For the first time since I'd entered the office, his smile faltered. There's nothing wrong with what you were doing. You just didn't have the right tools at your disposal. And you didn't have the proper guidance. Sometimes, the only path to actual recovery and healing is to go back the way you came. To find the source and flesh it out. I nodded. Not fully understanding, but desperately wanting to. And I just wanted to please him, to fix myself. I didn't really care how I did it. If this was going to help, I would do anything he asked me. It started with a hangnail. My bedroom door didn't lock anymore, but since I'd been showing so much progression in my sessions, and with a few encouraging words from Dr. Cipher, they started letting me have some of my privacy back in my life. After that sixth session, I had hurried home, the box tucked deep into my backpack, and a copy of Seventeen magazine. I didn't look at a single person on the bus, trying to dissolve my thoughts within the beats pouring out of my headphones, my heart racing in erratic, parallel patterns. Once I'd gotten home, I had sat on my bed, legs dangling and swinging over the edge, toying with the edge of the box. It really was a beautiful object. I hadn't gotten much of a chance to observe it in the office, but now that I had it all to myself, I could see geometric patterns crisscrossing over the entire surface, running my fingers along the dozens of intersecting lines. It felt as though there were untold stories buried in each curve. With a heavy sigh, I threw the box to the foot of my bed. Was I really going to do this? Continue damaging myself after I'd made so much progress? I hadn't so much as picked a scab or popped a pimple in a few days. Dr. Cipher had said anything I did from this point would be different. 
that it wouldn't be damage I was inflicting, but rather true healing through fire, through pain. I could fix myself, make myself whole again. That's when the hangnail caught my eye. Left hand, index finger. Lovely and little, hangnails were fun. So hard and sometimes unruly. They could shed blood so easily or just pop off from between your fingers or teeth. I glanced at myself in the full-length mirror on the back of my door and saw a puzzle staring back at me. Maybe this was just the final piece. Did I really have anything to lose? Bring my hand up to my mouth. I slid the nub between my teeth and began to chew. Then I remembered the box. Dr. Cipher had said that I lacked the proper tools to fix myself before, and here he had provided me with the perfect set. How can I make a hangnail more significant with a bunch of blades? I opened the box, running my fingers over a few of the blades before stopping on a relatively small one. The tip split at the middle. It felt cold and heavy in my hand, despite its size. I could just bite the hangnail off, but I figured there's no harm in trying something new, placing the nub in between the split portion of the knife's blade. I pushed down and in, flinching as the steel bit into my flesh and a line of blood formed at the nail bed. I stopped, breathed in deeply, and continued. It felt clean, it, as though this was the first time I'd ever actually picked at myself. And I felt in control. And then I sneezed. I couldn't move the blade in time. It slid forward. I dropped the knife, clapped my hand over my mouth and muffled a scream that would have brought my parents thundering up the stairs. My hand was on fire, my head throbbing. I sat rocking back and forth, big, hot tears streaming down my face. I didn't want to look, but I knew I had to. Slowly, I raised it up to my face. My entire arm was covered in blood from the tip of my finger down to my elbow. Fat drops fell in indistinct patterns on my dress and bedspread. Starting from the edge of my nail bed, I had shorn off the skin, all the way up to my last knuckle. It dangled loosely from my finger, pulsing with new, uncovered life. I felt sick. Throwing the knife to one side, I ran to the connected bathroom. Thank God I didn't have to go downstairs and vomited into my toilet. The flap of skin slapping against the white porcelain. I slumped against the floor between the toilet and the cabinet and dry heaved a few times. I couldn't even bring myself to look at my hand again. So I blindly felt for the loose skin. Gingerly folded it up against its separated host and wrapped far too much toilet paper around it. Aside from a few broken bones and sprains, this was the worst I'd ever hurt myself. There was nothing I could do. I felt my eyelids fluttering, a sense of drowning on dry land, and I succumbed to a sleep deeper than any I'd known in a while, if only for self-preservation. When I woke, I felt like I was underwater. There was a ringing in the air that I could just barely hear above the sound of my own heart beating and it felt like my arm had been sitting in an open fire for hours. The memory came flying back to me like a shot, the blade slipping, the searing pain, unsticking my cheek from the side of the toilet. I lowered my eyes to my hand and cringed. The toilet paper was soaked straight through. Red as an apple. I had really done it this time. I had straight up disfigured myself. I was disgusting. Weak. Pathetic. This wasn't therapy. This was mutilation. What... The fuck was Dr. Scyther thinking? The hot anger welled up and burned inside my chest. Then, the fear set in. How was I going to explain this to my parents? I'm gritting my teeth, I picked at the edge of the toilet paper. It was stuck, crusted to my skin. I wondered how much blood I'd lost. I didn't want to look, but I knew I had to see how bad it was before my parents did. Taking a deep breath, I braced myself and peeled back the toilet paper from the top where the skin had opened. I stopped and blinked. Nothing. There, there was nothing there. No cut, no gristle, no hangnail, no damage. Mind blank. 
I tore away the rest of the paper. Aside from dried blood, it was completely fine. My finger was perfectly healed. Was I dreaming? I asked myself. No, the pain was too real. On unsteady feet, I picked myself up and stumbled back into my bedroom. There it was, pristine, glinting in the light of the bedside lamp. The knife. There were small splashes of blood on the bedsheet around it, but the blade itself was spotless, just like it had been when I first opened the box. The air was practically humming. Oddly enough, so was the red jewel in the center of the box. It sounded like it was singing to me, soothing my self-imposed pain. It felt electric, alive. Then, I realized. So did I. It was as though a new life had flowed right into me, picking up scattered pieces as it went. I turned the beauty over and over in my hands, its previously cool surface now glowing with an inviting warmth. I didn't really understand, but I didn't need to. One little cut. A tiny amount of pain. Well, okay, well, a lot of pain. If a hangnail could make me feel this good. What about a bigger cut? I guess you could call me impressionable. I've always been that way. Quick to jump at anything, offering me a better chance. And this time, I felt like I could really take it. Without hesitation, I stuffed a handful of blanket in my mouth, took one of the larger knives, and dragged it deeply and swiftly across my thigh. The skin split like butter, right over an old scar. The pain was intense and blinding. I pitched forward, screaming into the self-imposed gag and grabbed for the other end of the blanket, wrapping it around my leg as quickly as I could. Shaking, I tied a knot and sat rocking back and forth, gripping my leg to my chest. Worth it. This was worth it. I could be new, whole again, fresh. I heard footsteps coming up the stairs, scrambling, the blood pounding in my head. I rushed to throw everything back in the box and shoved it under my pillow. I clicked the lamp off and turned on my side placing my wounded leg beneath me. As I held my breath, the door quickly creaked open. Shar? Mom's voice was always as soft as a feather. She never so much as raised her voice to me. I feigned sleepiness, dreams dripping from my tongue, and answered, Yeah, Mom? She came closer, and I could see her silhouette faintly against the light gray of the wall. Sitting down on the edge of my bed, she placed a hand on the back of my head and stroked my neck for a moment, before sighing deeply. Your father and I are so proud of you. I know things have been difficult lately, but you've been so strong in the last few weeks. Your birthday party's coming up in just over a month, and we want it to be perfect for you. If you think of anything special you want, just let us know. She leaned down, kissed me on the forehead, and left leg burning beneath my blanket wrap, and a lump set deep in my throat. I cried myself to sleep. Most nights, I dreamt of darkness. The surrounding envelope, the surrounding envelope, never nearly enough. That night, I dreamt of the beauty I wished to be. You're changing, darling, he said his gaze level and serene. I fidgeted nervously, but happily. All for the better. I'd walked into the office with a clouded head for the first time in weeks, the morning after the accident and the subsequent test. I had felt rejuvenated in a way that words could never touch. I'd woken up, looked at my hand, and then checked under the wrapping on my leg. Both were clear as a perfect summer day. The skin around the hangnail was smooth and soft, the spot where my scar had been like untouched cream. I was dumbfounded. I knew I hadn't dreamt any of it, even if the events hadn't been so clear in my mind's eye. The blood spoke volumes. I had quickly trashed my bedding that morning before my parents could see any of it, and got new sheets from the closet. The entire time I was remaking my bed, only one word ran through my mind. Perfection. I could carve out the bad. I had the power to remake myself.
I can make myself perfect. What are you? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Dr. Cypher laughed, and the sound a deep, hearty rumble. He leaned back in his chair, twirling a pen in his fingers. Just a doctor, Charlotte. A doctor who wants to see his patients extinguish the parts of themselves that cause them so much hurt to feel like they're anything other than beautiful. I looked out the window for a long time, counting the birds landing on the branches of the tree outside. I got to five before I could say something. How far will it go? I wondered aloud. As far as you'd like. What if I cut too deep? He waved a dismissive hand. Avoid major arteries and use your best judgment. You're a smart girl. Trust yourself. No. Come, let me see this week's diary entries. He slinked over to me and sat down on the red leather couch. With hands shaking just the slightest, I lifted my dress up past my thigh and held my breath. I could hear his own sharply enter his lungs. Beautiful, he murmured. He set warm fingers on cool skin, and I felt the same sense of satisfaction that I'd gotten from my new toys. And I felt the same sense of satisfaction that I'd gotten from my new toys. The rest of our session was quiet. Conversation based on the currency of exchanged breaths. The next few weeks flew by in a blur of pain, pleasure, and blood. I had perfected my methods, learning how to just barely graze the surface of mutilation without running the risk of an overnight infection or parental intervention. I felt like I'd truly become an artist. My blades, the brushes, my skin, the canvas, the doctor, my adoring audience. Every session, he would admire my work and pore over the finest details and provide constructive criticism and praise in spades. He was my angel, my benefactor, my muse. I learned to dance the edges across my skin in wondrous arcs that would have put ancient Rome to shame, dazzling the stark white of my skin with crimson notches and molted violet stars. Every time I cut away a new piece and gave myself to the cycle of sleep, the skin would regrow and reform into something new, something supple, something beautiful. With my progression, the pain grew as well, but so did my tolerance and understanding, my respect for the art of feeling in extreme. Eventually, I was shaking off entire half-foot-long patches of flesh, planting the seeds of perfection in my waiting soil and watering them plentifully with my tears and prayers. For each session, Dr. Scyther seemed to grow more and more proud. With every new development, his eyes and fingers began to linger for longer, taking in the taut new flesh as though it were the first painting that ever struck him, silent and numb. Our sessions developed into explorations of the body and ministrations of the mind. It was everything I had ever wanted. Things at home couldn't have been better. My parents had never so frequently told me how good I looked complimenting my hair and skin, even clothes left and right. They were so happy with my lack of picking and general positive attitude that but they never seemed to notice I stopped wearing shorts and t-shirts. Not that there was anything to hide. I never retained a single wound. I just didn't want to share my newfound glory with anyone but Dr. Cypher. Thankfully, I learned to contain the blood during my nightly sessions to the point where there was almost nothing to clean up anymore. Everything was going so well that I didn't realize I'd start to run out of imperfections. Almost all of my scars were gone. Some places had gone over twice, maybe even three times, but there was nothing left to fix. I looked in the mirror, painfully marveling at the glowing girl looking back, and wept for my loss. I barely touched myself. I couldn't bring myself to cut open my favorite patch of skin from my stomach or raise the meat on the back of my calves. I didn't mention anything to Dr. Cypher. I could feel myself becoming despondent in our sessions. There's nothing I could do about it. 
If you noticed, he didn't let on. He was far too enthralled in the thickets of spring's new garden, freshly bloomed. My birthday party was fun, but completely overshadowed by my distant, nagging sorrow. But I put on a happy face, the happiest one I could muster, if only for my parents, especially for my mom. She'd been so proud, so proud of my happiness and healing. And that night, I laid awake, staring at the ceiling, willing the small cracks to open and swallow me whole. They just sat there, dark blemishes on an otherwise white surface. I was exhausted, desperately hoping for the embrace of sleep. It felt years away. Then my mind wandered to my box, my brushes. I hadn't been ruining my canvas like I had all those previous years. I had been prepping it. I could paint myself. I could paint myself a whole new surface. Throw a fresh coat on the entire thing and start anew. I hopped out of bed, put down a towel, and got to work. I tore through layer upon layer, summoning rivers from the driest banks, letting the wildlife lap at the shores. An ocean of blood pounded in my ears and my bones creaked in opposition, but I just sliced and scratched and picked to every organic rhythm, oozing from dozens of fresh strokes. I bandaged myself up, took an Advil, and went to sleep. The sound of an ocean crashing waves in my ear. When I woke up, I was drowning. My entire frame felt like it had been soaked in gas and thrown in a wildfire. I sat up, with bile rising in my throat, the rush bringing a chorus of shrieking angels to dance on my skin, and tried to run to my bathroom. My legs gave out midway and I crashed to the floor as my arms landed in my field of vision. I saw a gruesome carnival of wounds peppering my skin. I screamed. Thankfully, my parents were both at work that morning, but I'm surprised that the entire neighborhood didn't come pounding on the door. I scrambled into the bathroom and stopped dead when I saw myself in the mirror. I looked like one of those illustrations from an old anatomy book. A good portion of my skin was just flat out missing or horribly riddled with gruesome patterns. Every conceivable space weeping red. I had to see Dr. Cipher immediately. My next appointment wasn't until two days from now, but I needed to see him to fix this. Blind with fear, I covered myself as best I could, gingerly dragging clothing over my ruined skin. I looked ridiculous in the heat, dressed head to toe in a long sleeve shirt, jeans, and a scarf. Thankfully, I hadn't touched my face or hands. I grabbed a pair of sunglasses and ran to the door. Then, it caught my eye. My box, my brushes, my tools. They've been so good for me. I derived so much pleasure and growth from them, they betrayed me. A flash of anger coursed through me, and I grabbed the box, shoving it in my bag. The bus ride felt like it took eons. I could feel everyone's eyes burning holes in my clothes, seeing the carnage underneath. The second I saw the corner with the office, I jumped up. The woman next to me gasped. Looking down, I saw her staring in horror at my seat. I followed her gaze, and my stomach lurched. A small pool of blood had formed and more was dripping from underneath my shirt. She raised her eyes to meet mine, and I could see her lips forming words she didn't want to speak, but the distant whoosh of the bus doors sliding open saved me. I ran out, across the street, and didn't stop until I saw Amy at the reception desk. I'd called ahead while I was waiting at the bus stop, and I guess she'd grown a soft spot for me because she penciled me in. There'd been a last-minute cancellation. I nodded a thank you and made a beeline for Dr. Cypher's office. The brass handle felt cold and uninviting in my hand. I wrenched it open and stepped inside, slamming it behind me. There he was, his demeanor calm and collected as ever, until he looked up at me. I don't know if it was the expression on my face or if he maybe saw the blood that had been seeping through my clothes in the twenty minutes it had taken me to get there, but as soon as his eyes met mine, he paled. The facade of collectedness dropped like a curtain, drawn on a badly executed play. Charlotte, Amy said you were coming. Are you all right? There's something wrong, I breathed, each syllable a pained effort. He stared at me. After a moment that felt like eternity, he put away the notepad he had been writing in and patted the chair. Come and sit. I don't want to talk. <laughs> I want you to fix this. Fix what, darling? The last word felt like so much poison on his lips. 
I cringed. Like lightning, I had the box open in my bag and slammed it on the desk with a crack. He pushed back his chair, the wood scraping, jarring on the floor. They're broken, I nearly screamed. A knocking sound pierced my veil of anger. Is everything all right in there? Amy's voice called through the door. Shaking just the slightest, Dr. Cipher responded. Yes, thank you. He didn't sound too sure. He turned back to me with an uneasy smile that definitely didn't reach his eyes. What's broken, Charlotte? I'm sure it's nothing we can't work through. Seething. I grabbed my left sleeve and pushed it up to my elbow. His face betrayed him instantly. It twisted into an expression of shock and disgust. I pushed up the other sleeve, and the expression doubled over. His eyes, now small and beady, flitted up to mine, and I could see everything I needed to know. His next words were lies. Looks like you went a little too far, sweetheart, but we can- He gulped audibly. We can fix this. He reached out a hand to mine. I slapped it away. Too far? Too fucking far? The anger coursing through me covered any sense of pain that I had left. All I could see now were the fires burning the office to ash and melting the skin from his ever-concerned face. I ripped my shirt over my head, taking the scarf with it, and unhooked my bra. Throwing them on the desk, he stared in absolute, abject horror, struck silent, unbuttoning and kicking off my jeans and underwear. I stood before him, stark naked, in all my visceral, bleeding glory. His hand awkwardly fumbled for the phone at the corner of his desk, but I grabbed it before I could reach it and threw it against the wall and shattered sending a wave of plastic across the floor. I'll show you too fucking far. Dragging a chair to the door, I managed to block it just in time. Amy was now pounding on it, yelling to ask what the noise was. I flew back to the desk, flipped open the box, and tipped it over, sending my instruments tumbling across the polished mahogany surface. I took my favorite scalpel, looked him directly in the eye, and cut down into the back of my forehead until I hit bone. Blood spurted out, covering both of us. Dr. Cipher screamed. A sound completely unsuitable for a man of his placid nature, and fell backwards into the wall with a crash. The pounding on the door grew louder, but I didn't care. I had my brushes and my canvas and my muse, all a girl could ask for. It took twenty minutes for the police to arrive and bust down the door. In that time, I had managed to create my best work of art yet. I had a brand new blank canvas. A good artist is never finished, never satisfied. This hospital is nice and clean, very minimal. I've been here for almost a week now. They have me on sedatives most of the time, which I really don't mind, though I do miss the pleasure in my pain. No bother, it's not like my nerve endings really function anymore. Mom and Dad visit me as much as they can. Mom sometimes passes out with her head against my pillow, tears staining the sheets. Dad's just quiet. The doctors say my body will never fully recover. Ever peeled a grape as a kid? That's what the majority of my skin looks like now. Just red, fleshy pulp. The cheese grater thing really did a number on me and the pliers weren't too forgiving. I really miss my brushes, but it's okay now. No matter where you are, who you are, or what you are, someone in this big wide world will find the beauty and the art in you. The young male orderly who works nights in my wing in the hospital is my newest patron. He likes the freshness beneath my bandages. I guess there really is a fetish for everything. He's been so sweet though, waiting on me hand and foot, bringing me whatever he can sneak in. He found me some new brushes, beautiful and sterile ones, and he showed me how to hide this file while I've been documenting my journey. After a few days, and all the psych evaluations, they had allowed me a laptop to keep a diary, because holding a pen was too difficult. I've always loved diaries. I keep a second one. Droll things about my day, my thoughts, my inner struggles, my hopes and dreams. I know they read it, but this one's been my little secret. My exhibit in Dr. Cypher's office was a hit. I wasn't his first project, but I know I was special. It's a shame that they took him away because all of those photos and videos and logbooks he kept, he was just an appreciator of the arts. I've given myself three more days. A good artist meets deadlines and he isn't afraid of a challenge. I'll open my next and final show to worldwide acclaim. I just know it.
My canvas burns with desire, and I can hear my new brushes singing to me from beneath my mattress. Pick me. Choose me. Become beautiful. Yes, yeah, so that one was uh, the longest one out of the ones we'll be listening to today. I hope you guys enjoyed that one. That one was Hangnail, and the song that I created is called Noella, which that one is available on Spotify if you'd like to hear it. Now, this next one we'll be listening to is a part of a series, but um, this one also has not been continued yet. Hopefully, Decompose will have the time to continue it. This one is called The Burning World. It's one of his more recent stories. The Burning World. There are worlds beyond the ones that we consciously and physically inhabit. I'm not talking about different planets or anything like that. These worlds are very much here, on this earth, in front of our faces. We may not be able to see them, but we can absolutely feel them. Dreams are the closest we get to these hidden realms while we're still alive. And I would have been happier never even knowing they existed. But then I found the diaries, and everything changed. Asshole, I whispered, gently shoving Carl off my foot. Sorry, he replied. He took a few steps back. We were standing just inside the doorway to the basement, staring into the black maw of the stairwell. The house, abandoned for well over twenty years, had seen its fair share of rot. It smelled like death itself had taken up residence, laying claim to the keep. If its tenancy was here, it had fled. The entire building was bereft of life in the hour that we'd been creeping around its wasted confines. We hadn't seen a single sign of it, not even a fly. A shiver racked my frame, and I unconsciously brought a hand up to rub my arm, finding the skin disturbed with waves of goose flesh. It was a warm night, but I felt like I'd been dipped in ice water. Well, are we going to do this or not? I looked up at Carl and sighed. And this had been his idea, not mine. But for some reason, I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to crawl around rusted nails and broken floorboards in the middle of the night. Stepping down into the darkness, a small flashlight illuminating my way. I tried not to let my hand shake, but the pale yellow beam betrayed me. I'd seen my fair share of abandoned buildings, so-called haunted houses, and traipsed through plenty of acres of creepy woods. But something about a dilapidated house in the middle of an otherwise completely inhabited street made me feel incredibly uneasy. We reached the bottom step and looked around, flashlights sweeping across the shadowy walls in huge arcs, stacks and stacks of boxes, large forms of different sizes covered by ratty old sheets, a latticework of pipes that probably hadn't been used in decades, typical basement. Walking forward, I absentmindedly grabbed the corner of one of the sheets and dragged it with me, revealing a beautiful antique dresser. From the other side of the room, Carl was turning a brass clock over in his hands. Alongside the lack of insect life, I noticed something new. There was no sound coming from the house whatsoever. No creaking floorboards, no dripping water, nothing. In a house this old, even long abandoned, you'd think there'd be something. Rolling the hard edge of the sheet between my fingers, I glanced at Carl. Do you hear anything? He tore his eyes away from the clock and looked at me. A puzzled expression painted across his face. He listened hard for a moment, cocking his head to the silence, and then shook it. No? The question was obvious in his voice. Well, I mean, shouldn't we? I don't think I'm following. It's been completely silent since we walked in here. I can't hear anything from the house or anything from outside. He checked his watch. It's late. Mm, it's only 11. There are still cars driving down the street and people walking outside. It's not that late. I don't hear a single thing. He shrugged and returned the clock to its shelf. I wasn't sure why it bothered me so much, but it did. I glanced around the room, shining my light in the far wall and felt my heart leap into my throat. I stumbled backwards and dropped my flashlight, sending it bouncing into the bottom of the stairs. There was a person standing against the wall, facing it. What the fuck was that? 
Carl hoarsely whispered. There's someone down here. Over there. It was all I could do not to scream. I pointed a shaking hand at the wall and he followed with his light. It landed on a tall, gaunt figure. Even with our attention now on it, it didn't move. I got up, brushing the dirt off my jeans, and mustered up the courage to speak. Hello? No response. We both stepped forward, and I repeated the request. Hello? Are you all right? Nothing. I was about to just bolt back up the stairs when Carl laughed. The sound cut through the air like a judgmental blade. He closed the gap between him and the figure, grabbed it by the back of the neck, and pulled it forward. It was an old robe, draped over a coat rack. He grinned at me, and shook the robe in a faux menacing style. Terrifying. Shut up. You were scared too. I huffed, snatching my flashlight off the ground. Embarrassment burned into my cheeks. Embarrassment burned in my cheeks. Let's get, let's get out of here. This place is obviously a bust. We hadn't come here with a plan, and I was starting to get tired. Not to mention thoroughly freaked out. Most urban exploring outings were just a series of self-perpetuated jump scares and dirty clothes. I started up the stairs and was about halfway up when he called back to when he called back out to me. Mara, wait. There's something behind the rack. I turned to find him crouching close to the floor, fiddling with something on the wall. Through a swirl of dust clinging to the still air of the basement, I could see something glinting, dully in his hands, illuminated by the flashlight. Patting back down the stairs and across the room to join him, I could see that it was a long, serrated knife. Hunched over, Carl had his back to me. I could see it moving up and down with his short, quick breaths. A low whistling noise seemed to be coming from somewhere deep in his chest, and he began to shake. Carl? I whispered. His breath quickened, and the whistling got louder, turning into a soft moan, and I took a step back. Carl, what the hell? He jumped up, spinning around, his eyes wild and wide as he lunged for me. I shrieked and fell into a row of boxes, knocking them over. A shower of random objects rained down on me. I picked an old athletic jockstrap off my face and flung it. Then the monster was gone. The typical jackass Carl was back, giggling like a schoolboy. What the fuck is wrong with you? I was shaking, both with fear and anger, and slapped away the hand he offered. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. You're such a major asshole. He held up his hands, palms toward me. I know, I know, it's, it's my specialty. Actually, there really is something behind the rack. I don't care. Mara, there's a bunch of books back here. My ears perked up. Books? I love books. And anything down here would have been pretty old if the rest of the decor and environment had anything to say about it. I walked over and punched him in the arm and knelt down next to where he'd been. He was right. Tucked away in a hole in the wall, hiding behind broken shards of brick and plaster, was a pile of neatly stacked books. I reached in, careful not to touch any of the shattered wall, and plucked them out. Covered in a thin layer of leather, they were cool and smooth. They looked handmade and bound. A familiar tickle crept up my back from the base of my spine to the top of my skull, and I shivered with delight. This was a special find. Something back into the wall, I placed all but the top book on the ground next to me and opened it to the first page. The stitching cracked with a newfound life, but the page was blank. Bringing it closer to my face, I inhaled deeply, the scent of paper stricken with age, treaded with a heady spin. Carl raised an eyebrow and shook his head. Rolling my eyes, I flipped through a few more pages. They were all blank. Disappointed, I let them fan through my fingers until the sight of ink caught my eye. A few straight, horizontal lines were drawn in the middle of the page, and underneath them were words. Fire, light my way. Scrawled in flowing, looping script. The next page was full of the same handwriting. Curious, I flipped to the back of the book and found what appeared to be the beginning of the journal. Odd. It seemed as though the entire thing was written backwards. I cleared my throat and started to read. Diary of ESC, 1962. 
My eyes flicked up and met Carl's. The expression on his face was one of muted interest, but I could tell he was as intrigued as I was. I went on. June 12th. There's a deep scent that permeates all. I smell it. I taste it. I can almost see it. It cloaks me like a fine perfume, and I am reborn each night through the womb of ash. This is the burning world. That which is taken from me every night I lay down and close my eyes. The clouds sing deep and harmonious in congress with the earth as they spit flames down upon it, and the father of strands comes to greet me with open arms, grasping me close with his slick, wet body. I see within him, and as he closes his many limbs around me, I am touched by the spirit of all his children. The father worries, and I worry along with him. He knows and tells me so, that the garden of ash is not yet ready, that the soil has not yet been properly tilled, and thus the seeds will not come to flower under the first red moon. Ever since I was a child, the father has been preparing me for this bounty, prepping me in every way possible to take on my role as the gardener. So, I must burn. I must burn more and raise the earth spreading the fields as far and deep as I may. And then, and only then, will the garden be prepared for the sacred unity. I stopped reading and blinked, hard. It sounded like some half-cocked instruction manual, introduction for the world's end. Who could possibly have written this? Carl's mouth was hanging half open, his eyes fixated on the pages. Passing over a small sketch of a circle, surrounding three vertically placed dots, I poured over the rest of the words in the day's entry. More talk of, of fires, and gardens of ash, and the kiln of absolution. Of this father and his children, I flipped through three more pages of ramblings, skimming, and found the next entry. This one was dated June 23rd. The crops are finally prepared. The grounds have been blessed by the sacrament of fresh blood, and the father is pleased with my work. He says that any day now, we will be ready for the planting. Watering is so much easier with live vessels, but the can works just as well, I suppose. The orchard is finally coming to a head, such a blessing to have trees bearing our own fruit. Oranges, apples, plums, all delicious and ripening. The days are getting longer still. It feels as though the summer is eternal. There have been some mishaps lately. The young ones are so very difficult to wrangle. They have such strength, such will. Just the other day, against the birth of the morning sky, I had a calf escape her tether. She ran and ran, hollering her lungs out. But fortunately for myself and the father, she was not a very smart one. Coming upon the barriers, she tripped and fell into the trenches. A barb spiked her piercing clean through her abdomen, and blessed the exit of her skin with a holy kiss. How she screamed. I made quick work of silencing her, but it was too late. She was already on her way into the other realm, unfortunate to lose a young one so very quickly. But these things happen. I brought her back to the kiln of absolution, and fed her to it, uttering the prayer of blackening. With as much reverence as I could muster, I sang loud and bright. I stopped stuttering over the next words. They were in a language I couldn't recognize. I managed to sound them out. Vecinia es Billy sente, sente frilium, sente messilius, tre evigna, tra evignoi, vene ilsa, vene ilsa. The foreign chant felt cold and dead on my tongue. The father joined me, taking my hand, and we watched as her supple pink flesh bubbled and burst in the warm belly of the kiln. She screamed her vocal cords raw, retching her stomach out, and I saw fear pool and boil in her eyes, and smelled death come for her soul before the pain became too much to bear. As the doorstep was laid upon, the other realm opened. And for the first time, I laid my eyes upon the future of sorrows. It was bleak but welcoming, and I knew my place in this world was righteous. 
the Mother of Echoes will hear us and find her and guide her accordingly. And all shall be forgiven. I heard a soft choking noise and glanced up, shaken from the trance of the words on the yellowing pages. Carl had a hand clamped over his mouth, and I could see the confusion and fear pricking at his eyes. Did she... Did whoever wrote that just describe burning someone to death? I'm not sure. I think so. I swallowed hard, trying to clear the lump from my mouth, and attempted to parrot his fear. But I couldn't help but subconsciously coddle the excitement growing in my chest. We'd obviously stumbled across something intangible and wrong, but also incredible. I think I've heard enough. Let's go and ditch Crazy's fire fantasies. I looked at the pile of four other books, sat between us, and nodded. There was no way I was going to leave them here. Getting to my feet, I quickly slipped the books under my jacket. That's when I noticed the burning smell. Alarmed, my head snapped around looking for the scent's origin, but I saw nothing out of the ordinary. Then I realized that the air in the room was hazy, as though I was seeing through a wisp of smoke. I laughed and shook my head, waving away the thought. I was just imagining things, spooked by the basement and the story. Then, Carl looked at me, his face screwed up, and said, Do you smell that? Is that... is that smoke? My heartbeat sped up a little, and I could feel heat radiating from the books hidden under my jacket. As I opened my mouth to reply, a wash of red and blue light spilled into the basement through the small window at the top of the wall. A wave of terror rolled over me as Carl and I ducked behind the large stack of boxes, accidentally sending a metal canister clamoring to the floor. Cutting through the still night air, we heard the sound of cars' engines being killed, two doors slamming, and footsteps crunching on gravel. Carl stared at me, his eyes brimming with fear, and my heart pounded a thick, arrhythmic tattoo in my ears. The smell of smoke grew all around us, encasing our heads in a virile cloud. The front door of the house opened somewhere above us. The echoes of voices over a radio channel sounded a million miles away, like angels through a fog. Hey everybody, I hope you liked this video. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe so I can spend more time creating narrations and music for you. Have a good night. Looks like we have two more now these ones are more the eh. now these ones are more recent so some of you may have already heard these ones i kind of doubt most of you have heard the older ones specifically because the body book has 79 views um so that's why i didn't really have a problem using it in this video because i have I'm, not, I'm pretty confident most of you haven't heard those ones but uh i mean and all 79 views are just me you know because yeah, I just love the sound of my own voice. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But um, uh, with these two ones, these ones are more recent, so I'm pretty sure you guys have, have heard them. One of them, it's uh, Mother Sound and Carlotta, Queen of the Rats. So, actually, no, Carlotta, Queen of the Rats is kind of old. Nah, screw it. Anyway, I hope you guys like rats, because it's about rats. Carlotta, Queen of the Rats. Carlotta was a quiet girl. She did all of her chores, kept her room very tidy, and never spoke back to her parents. She led a normal, quiet girl's life. School, homework, family time in front of the TV, and playing with friends. She didn't know anything beyond that, and frankly, she didn't need to. When her daddy had to leave his job at the factory, he became upset, not with her, not with mommy, but upset with the whole world, it seemed. A few days later, daddy started drinking from a dark bottle that seemed to hold the answer to all of his problems. It whispered back and forth to him all night, sharing secrets and the sweetest of tales, and lamented the weight of his words in the morning. His eyes... Once a clear crystal blue started to turn redder than the sky sipping away 
at the last bits of the day. Collada would try to catch his smile at the breakfast table, but it bounced right off, wrinkles being etched farther and farther into his face day by day. Mommy remained silent, watching the bottle from afar. Mommy never listened to it, nor told its secrets of her own. But she also didn't interrupt its moments with Daddy. He became more and more withdrawn, barely speaking to either of them, only wanting to spend time with the bottle. The sadness and tension she felt between her parents grew with each passing day. It sat heavy and dark in her heart and poked at her stomach with sharp little fingers, never finding their mark but searching nonetheless. After a particularly hard day at school, Carlotta came home, flopped onto her bed, and the tears began welling up. She just couldn't hold it back anymore. Once the first tear, sullen and alone, hit her pillow, the rest followed in a steady stream. So caught up in her sorrow, Carlotta was, that she almost didn't feel the bed sheets rustling by her feet. It wasn't until the rustling had moved up to her stomach that, startled, she pushed herself onto her elbows and found herself staring into a furry white face with tiny red eyes. It was a rat, no bigger than her fist, and with a plump, pinkish-white belly. It sat on her stomach and stared into her eyes with a look of odd intelligence wiping snot and tears away from her face with the back of her hand. Her voice barely above a whisper, she said, Hi, who are you? The plump little rat quickly wiped its face with the back of its tiny paws, mimicking her. Pip. We are Pip. His voice was hushed, high-pitched but comforting, like a whistle from the depths of a dream. She sniffled. Well, hi, Pip. My name is Carlotta. Who is we? We is me. But we is the down below, too. Where is the down below? Pip cocked his head to the side, as though confused by the question. Then his eyes lit up, and he scurried to the edge of the bed. Below. Down below is here down below. He pointed a paw and Carlotta peered over the edge of her bed, hands bunched up in her burgundy sheets. She didn't see anything. Where, Pip? Lower, down below. Pushing herself forward, she clutched the edge and moved her head closer to the floor, with her long hair brushing the carpet. She lowered herself until she could see beneath the mattress and drew in a sharp breath of air. From behind the shadows of the toy boxes and hidden piles of lone socks, a few dozen eyes stared back at her, red and unblinking. Jumping back, she glanced at Pip, now sitting on chubby haunches, licking away at nothing on the back of his leg. What's in the down below? she said, her voice trembling just the slightest. Family, she blinked. The family? Although the past few weeks had been rough, she already had a family. Without trying, she let a low whistle seep past her lips, spilling out into the air of her room. Instantly, Pip stopped what he was doing and hopped up. His attention trained on her. There was a deep rustling noise from beneath the bed. Pip, are you all right? Pip is fine. Pip heard the queen's noise. Pip is ready. Carlotta was puzzled. Did he mean the whistle? She pursed her lips together and let out a steady stream of air in a louder, higher pitch. Pip did a strange little dance in a circle and ran closer to her, clambering up onto her sweater. She blinked and suddenly found herself surrounded by rats, all different shapes and sizes and colors. They sat along the edge of her bed in a row, glowing red eyes focused on her with rapt attention. She wasn't scared. She felt the love and reverence radiating from them like soft, 
stubble heat. Drawing in a deep breath, she let out a third whistle. This one was long and soft, and before she could even get her lips fully centered around the note, the rats overtook her, tiny paws trapezing all over her body in a swarm of dawny fur. She giggled and squirmed as they disappeared beneath her clothes into the curls of her hair, and even one found footing in the cuff of her jeans. From all over her body, she heard the soft murmurs of one word repeated over and over. Queen. She'd always been afraid of what might be under the bed. She just didn't know it could be friends. Carlotta slept well that night, resting on a cloud of white cotton and fur. So entranced was she by the company of her new friends that she almost forgot about the dark cloud of Daddy and his own new friend. It sat and stared at her from his clutches as he sank further and further into his favorite armchair in the living room. Their family time in front of the TV became sullen and filled with silence. They no longer laughed at jokes together in commercial breaks. Once muted to discuss the goings-on on their show, were now filled with blaring advertisements and swigs from Daddy's bottle. One day, the curtain being pulled around Daddy became too much for her to bear, and Carlotta decided that she needed to put a stop to the bottle and its lies. Whatever it was telling him, it couldn't be true. The world just wasn't that sad, and she and Mommy loved him so. She waited until that night when both of her parents were out of the house, Mommy at a friend's, and Daddy off somewhere unknown, and crept into their room. Rummaging through the closet, she found nothing. She checked the dresser and came up empty-handed once more. Then, in the depths of the chest at the foot of their bed, she found it. The dark brown glass twinkled faintly as she held it up to the light. She held it close to her ear but heard nothing. Whatever its secrets were, they weren't spilling for her. Popping the top off, she brought it to her nose and inhaled. Dark, sour-smelling fumes seemed to dance around her head. Wrinkling her nose, wrinkling her nose, she raised the mouth of the bottle to her lips and tasted its innards, finding nothing but what seemed to be bitter and foul water. She spat it onto the floor and sat down heavily. How could Daddy possibly find happiness in this? She thought to herself. There must be something dark and evil at play. Then she had an idea, a revelation, she would free Daddy from the grasp of his gross mistress once and for all. Carlotta grabbed the bottle, hopped up, and headed towards the bathroom down the hall, a smirk playing at her lips. Why hadn't she thought of this sooner? Watching the contents of the bottle swirl down the drain, she could only think of better days to come. She would have her Daddy back. Then, as though summoned from her daydream, he appeared behind her in the mirror. She turned in place, ready to show him that he was free, and was met with a blotchy, bloated red face and sunken eyes. Car, what are you doing? His words were slow and slurred, coming from someplace far away. Hi, Daddy. I got rid of the bottle. I know it's been hurting you, and I wanted to help. You're free now. His eyes trailed behind her seeing the last drops of the bottle's contents flee towards the dark maw of the drain. Suddenly, they went from being hazy and red to being filled with something she didn't understand. She opened her mouth to say something else, and then she was seeing darkness. Once the stars cleared from her eyes, she found herself sitting on the bathroom floor against the wall and felt a throbbing pain blossoming in the side of her face, bringing a shaking hand up to touch her cheek. She looked up and saw her daddy looming over her, shaking with rage. Tears welled up in her eyes and spilled hot and heavy onto her cheeks. D daddy The air around him seemed to shake along with his hands, reaching for her, angry and grasping. Knowing the bottle was still alive and holding its control steadfast, she ran, scrambled between his legs and bolted out of the bathroom towards her bedroom. 
She could hear him following close behind, footsteps thundering down the hall hot on her trail. She made it to her door, retching it open, and flung herself inside, dragging a chair up to it. She wedged it under the doorknob. Just as she set it in place, something heavy hit the door, and it flexed under the weight, but held steady. She scrambled backwards, hitting the bed, and sat down hard. Wrapping the blanket around her in a protective cocoon, though her room was dark, moonlight spilled through her lone window and illuminated it well. She continued to sob, the waves hitching in her chest. Then the door burst open, flinging the chair to the side and slamming into the wall. She shrieked. In the doorway, her daddy stood, huffing and puffing and seething, his eyes dark, even in the soft gloom of the night. He stepped forward, one foot after the other, closing the space between them. Daddy, please, she pleaded, but her words fell on deaf ears. He couldn't hear her through the anger boiling inside of him. The bottle now had full control. Another step, then another. Soon he would reach her. Shaking with fear, unable to do anything but cry, she did the only other thing she could think of. She whistled, low and dull. It permeated the room, bouncing softly off the walls. Rustling noises came from all four corners, from behind her and underneath her. She whistled again, louder and sharper this time, and the sound of the rustling grew in unison. Her daddy stopped his stuttered movements, dropping his hands to his side and looked down at the floor. What, what is that? He slurred. Swaying, he looked first behind him, and then all around, through the thick veil of tears, Kalata could see tiny red pinpricks glowing in the shadows, moving quickly across the floor. She took a deep breath, looked into her daddy's face, and whistled a third time. Seconds later, he began screaming, flailing, stumbling back and forth. He tore at his legs and slapped at his chest. Carlotta could see lumps under his clothes, moving in quick, erratic patterns, like a frantic marionette. He spun and spun in place, trying in vain to rid himself of the invasion, but the rats were too fast, too dedicated. They bit and scratched and burrowed into him, making homes in the wasted remnants of would-be safety. Then, just as quickly as it had started, it stopped. He fell, a thick, heavy sound, and his body sank into the wall. Finally, slumping to the floor, a thick liquid oozed from his throat, black in the night, and pooled in a circle around his head. His eyes stared open and glossy at the foot of her bed. She knew something stared back, soft and quiet as a mouse, willing away the remaining tears. She crept down from her bed and rolled underneath it in the warm hearth of the down below. Her furry subjects found their place around her still shaking form and nestled against her, although their coats were slick and wet. She cooed and petted them. She felt their love. Dozing off, Carlotta slept safe and warm in the company of her family, her plague, her mischief. They would always protect her, for she was the queen of the rats. All right, so on to our last story. This one is called Mother Sound. This one is, uh, it's, it's another one that's a bit abstract, um, but one thing that's my favorite about this story is the various different things I got to do with sound. Now, there was an issue with this audio file, which sucks. Uh, it got corrupted, and I'm debating on re-recording everything and making a new video, because with the current audio file, there's some issues with the frequencies. But I did my best to clean this one up and uh, uh, make it sound better than the original video. But hope you guys enjoy. Make sure to let me know what you think of this one, too. This one is called Mother Sound. If you're like me, 
Even the incoming vibration of a phone can set your teeth on edge. It's an anxiety thing. I know it's rational, but that doesn't stop me from playing chicken with my cell phone every single time. Sitting at my bedroom desk, desperately trying to get the words to flow out of my gummed up brain and onto the screen through my cursor angrily blinking in my face. The dull <laughs> lashing out against my elbow made me jump. I looked down at the screen. Alex, my brother, sighing. I picked it up, put him on speakerphone. Hey, what's up? A silence, a few muffled breaths. I waited for a moment, listening. Alex, are you there? Hey. His voice was low and cracked. It's, it's Stephanie. She, she's gone. My blood ran cold. Even without context, those simple words shot a bead of sweat over my forehead and a dagger of ice through my chest. Steffi was my niece, Alex's eight-year-old daughter. What do you mean, gone? It's more silence. Not knowing made the seconds drag by like exhausted hours. Alex, you can't just call up. I went to her room just to wake her up for dinner. She was taking a nap. The words spilled out of the phone bouncing throughout the room like a frantic bird. He took a big, panicky breath. I just put down to take a nap. I went to the corner store to get something and came back and she was gone. I closed my eyes, trying to blink the words away, hoping they would make more sense when I reopened them. They didn't. Did you check the house completely? I said, trying to offer some semblance of comfort. She needs an adventurous kid. If she was napping, she could have gotten up and gone to another room, crawled into a nook or something. Remember that one time she got stuck in the bathroom closet and you couldn't find her for like two hours? This isn't like that, Nick. I checked literally everywhere, even the basement closet. She's not in the house. She's not anywhere. I tried to think of something to calm him down, but came up with air. Look, just relax. Take a breath. I'll come over and we can look for her to get... The twin noises sounded softly in my ear signifying the end of the call. I took my face out of my hands where I'd been rubbing my temples and glanced down at the phone. The little lines of dots representing my service had been dropped down to one. Then a moment later, they were gone completely. I usually had great service, especially in the house. And I toggled the Wi-Fi switch. Nothing. Getting up, I crossed the room to the closet and opened it. I knelt down to check the router. The lights sat black, empty, motionless. My internet and phone were from the same company. And this has happened before, so it didn't strike me as too odd. Maybe a trunk line was down somewhere. Alex's house was a 20-minute drive from mine, so I grabbed my jacket, hopped in the car, and headed over. The ride was oddly silent. Even with the music playing in the background, the second Alex had dropped those first few words on me, a chill crept up my spine and I couldn't shake it, no matter how hard I tried. Something was wrong. The words sat hot and heavy in the back of my head and pawed away greedily at the walls of my stomach. Something is very wrong. Fiddling with the knob on the stereo, I turned it over to a classic rock station, 106.3 WAMX. It's my favorite. However, where there should have been a dulcet wail of Stevie Nicks or the fiery licks of Joe Perry ripping through a heated solo, I found nothing but static. I tried rowing through a few more stations and came up with the same results. It was crackling silence. An intangible feeling had started to blanket my mind lending gentle whispers into an ear already poised towards the unknown. I went to turn the radio off completely and sit the rest of the ride in silence. But a voice stopped my hand dead in the air. Well, not so much a voice, but rather a clash of sounds trying to sound here. Have you ever imagined what the churning of an ocean might sound like if we gave it a voice? An amalgamation of foreign sounds fighting each other, clamoring to the top, choking on each other's blood, 
begging for the privilege of breath. Place. I was entranced, hanging on every word. So much so that I didn't see the little red two-door cross over into my lane directly in front of me. The whisper had become a shrill, breathy screech. Flashing, rubber burning, blaring honk. The precipice of metal begging to flex and break, birthing twisted towers through flesh. I snapped out of it, seeing the terrified face of the driver in the rear view of the Mazda ahead of me, and slammed on my brakes, sending everything in the cab of the truck flying forward in a cacophonous wave. My heart screamed heavy and thick in my ears, pushing out the memory of the phantom voice. I bit clear through my bottom lip. The pain blossomed, quick and sharp a spatter of blood flew to kiss the steering wheel like a long-lost friend. I quickly pulled over to the side of the road and threw myself into park. With shaking hands, I, I shook a cigarette out of the pack, hugging the back of my sun visor and lit up. I've been in a couple accidents in my life, and even the most distant of close calls was enough to send me into a panic. With a few drags in my system and the smoke clearing around my fingers, I stared at the radio. It was once again silent and unassuming, spitting hushed, gargled static back at me. I rolled the dial all the way back, killing the sound completely. My phone rang. The sound almost gave me a heart attack, especially considering I always keep it on vibrate. Grabbing for it with sweaty fingers, I looked at the caller ID. It was Alex. Oh, thank God. He probably found Stephanie. I answered, bringing the phone up to my ear. Hey, man. Yo. My voice audibly shaking. I swallowed hard, took a deep breath, continued, leveling my tone as much as I could. Is everything okay? Hey, I lost the call while I was in the house and haven't had service since. I'm almost there, but if you found her, I can head back. In protest, my stomach growled. I hadn't eaten since breakfast, and my brother was a great cook. Unless, of course, you guys don't mind company for dinner. I laughed. Silence. No breathing. No static. Nothing. Not even a whisper of normal feedback you might expect from a shitty cell phone. Maybe my network was still having issues. I sighed. I'd been planning on switching providers for a while, but this was coming at the worst possible time. Definitely the last straw. I was about to hang up when I heard a whistle. It wasn't like a person whistling, more like the wind whipping through a chain link fence. More like a soft howl. I stared at the phone, me gripping it hard in my hand. As the sound grew in volume and strength, I don't know when it went from the realm of the call to the air around me, but within seconds, it was like the night itself was moaning, wide eyed. I sat there, enraptured by impossibility and absurdity. Then, through the sheet of noise, the voice returned, loud and angry. A torrent, it screamed. Mother sound, scream for echoes. Mother sound seeks the blood. Come to the mother sound. Bring the sound. I tore my eyes away from the phone and looked through the windshield. What had been a cloud this night? steadily growing darker in the minutes prior was now a mess of hazy fog, surrounding and tying the last strands of light into a ball and leaving them to choke one singular point in the sky. It was as though a hand had actually formed dense cloud coverage and was holding the remnants of dust captive. And then I saw the hand actually take form Slender, feminine fingers pushed their way out of the wispy clusters as though through smoke, grasping at nothing, unable to comprehend the actual surface of the seething mass and fragments of light. 
My eyes instead presented a twisted vascularity of shadows and clouded mist. Where there should have been nails, the swirling vortex braided muscles churn, pumping viscous black blood back and forth over its wasted surface. The leviathan hand waved to the earth below it, outstretched digits mimicking a massive dying spider and grasped the fading sun miniature and pathetic against its godlike spread as the dark rods crinkled in massive joints and enveloped a pale citrine orb. I heard a pop ring out, not from any specific point of origin, but rather from the earth, from the air, from within my own body. I screamed, feeling every ounce of my blood pressurize and flex against my veins, but the sound was lost amongst the swell of the sky mourning the sun. Night fell hard. And so did my eyes. When I came to, I felt like a bullet shot through a plate of glass. I drenched in sweat, my entire body throbbing and heaving in waves of pain. I snapped my head from side to side, looking for any sign of abnormality. It was dark, and darker than I'd seen in a while. I flipped the internal cab lights on, and the blood from my lip that had landed on the steering wheel looked like it had traveled upwards, leaving a dripping trail in the wrong direction. Then I caught sight of myself in the mirror, almost threw up. Scarlet rivulets of blood ran up my hairline from the corner of my eyes, mouth, and nose, apparently so eager to get out that they left clear impressions on my skin, now quickly giving way to light purplish bruises. I brought a hand up to touch my cheek and found myself looking at a limb that seemed like it belonged to a high school science class. My skin shone with an unearthly, almost iridescent glow. Almost translucent in the artificial light, I could see the arteries pumping double time in an attempt to please an unseen master with my heart furiously sped to keep up. I grabbed the hem of my shirt and lifted it, revealing an ocean of rippling flesh frozen in time. My stomach and chest looked like a desiccated tree trunk, deprived of a single drop of moisture, vines begging to burst through the shallow depths of the bark. Tears I didn't even know I could shed at this point were dripping down my face, kissed with a hint of red from the blood. It seemed as though they didn't desire the same elevated path as their crimson kin. A buzzing noise, thick with robotic artificiality, was humming through the air, deep and monotonous. I was starting to feel tight, extremely tight and claustrophobic. My phone rang. This time I didn't jump. It was almost as though I was expecting the call. The ringtone cut through the still air, calling to me like a digital siren. I answered. Hello? The voice coming through my lips sounded nothing like my own. It was gravelly and far away. The silence. Silence I was used to by now. And the chattering. Almost a whisper. Something lost. Looking for its mother. Mother sound. Begs for the higher world to echo. Needs the blood. To cleanse the cloud. Then, a faint noise in the background, a gentle sound, a child's voice, singing a sweet lullaby. It blended in in the foreground, still chanting its mantra for blood and echoes, mother sound, and they became an imperfect duet. After a moment, I, I recognized the tune. It was the same one Steffi's mother Alicia used to sing to her every night before bed. A beautiful song of her own origin, crafted with tender love and care. When Steffi would wake in the middle of the night with terrors dancing in her head, Alicia would rush in and change the pitch just the slightest, letting the wordless melody wash over her in a cocoon of comfort. When Alicia lay dying, 
her body infested with tumors feeding cancer to every conceivable inch. She would sit with Steffi's head, laying against her gaunt, hollow chest, still singing her song. Now, Steffi's voice pouring those tones through my phone walled me, called to me, comforting my writhing form. Without thinking of what I was doing, my hands turned the key of the ignition and gripped the steering wheel. Ten and two, I gently depressed the gas pedal and continued down the road to Alex's house, watching the space where the god hand had been out in the corner of my eye. When I arrived, parking in the driveway next to my brother's dark green minivan, I could feel autopilot driving me forward. I could feel the house and the sky above me singing to me, calling my name using the sheet of my niece's innocence to drive the want home. I could feel the air around me pulsating, pressing into my skin with little prickling fingers, kneading out knots and soothing tired joints. I could feel loose rocks in the driveway as I stepped out on unsteady legs, the lingering heat seeping from my exhaust pipe and still purring engine. In the empty house before me, I could feel everything. I could still hear the song reverberating all around me. Making my way through the dark halls with a head that felt underwater, I found the source of the song in the heart of the house. In Steffi's bedroom, at the foot of her bed, Alex was lying curled around a bedpost the gnarled claws of his hands clutching loosely at one of the dozens of ragged holes perforating his stomach and chest. His organs, half lying outside of his wasted body, were now little more than gelatinous soup sitting in a kiln of muscle and bone. The look on his face, however, betrayed the torment of his flesh. It was one of pure elation, his eyes sitting slightly popped out on the puffed edges of his cheeks, shone with the same simple ecstasy. The siren song, now tapering off, was coming from within his body. I walked over to the bed, each step a renewed autonomous effort, as the sound grew more and more muted. In a bundle of sheets soaked through with blood, there was a pile of clothing, small pair of glasses and a golden locket. I knew the photo that laid within. I'd taken it of Steffi, Alicia, and Alex at a family picnic just five months prior to Alicia's death. I fell to my knees, landing against the edge of the bed and dragging the sheets with me. I gently touched the locket as my skin came in contact with the cool metal. A shockwave rocked the entire house, and the song picked up again, bouncing off the walls, and again, the confines of my aching skull. I cried out, joining the swell, and watched as the blood coating the surfaces of the room leapt up from both cloth and skin alike, twirling through the air in a liquid abrasive, and passed through the ceiling into the waiting night sky. I hope you all enjoyed this video and thank you so much for 3,000 subscribers I'm super excited about that I was debating on what type of video to make for you guys because like my first like my 1,000 subscriber video was really weird my second one was pretty weird I was thinking about going like that route and making some sort of weird video I even kind of like uh, uh, videotaped my roommates just like chilling and I was gonna like dub that over some I don't know something but um yeah so I, I figured I'd do this instead I'm gonna you know, give you a nice, what is that, three hour long? Oh no, two and a half. Well, I'll just go fuck my face, whatever. Uh, I didn't want three hours anyway. I hope you guys liked the video. Let me know what you think. Uh, I was hoping that this video would help show my progression and how I've uh, grown, I guess, since I started my channel about eight months ago. Uh, what do you guys think? Do you guys think I've gotten better? I know that there was a issue I had with uh, reading too fast 
And that's just because my normal talking voice, I talk fast. I talk way too fast. But I've been working on that for my reading. Do you guys think that's been getting better? If you guys have any other suggestions, please let me know. I want to make sure that I do whatever I can to make sure I'm making the best content for you guys. And if you enjoyed this video and you aren't subscribed to my channel and you'd like to subscribe, it would be very helpful, but don't feel pressured. You do you, you know? And if you like the music I create, the artwork I create, my narrations, and you'd like to support the channel, I do have a Patreon page uh, for just the basic $1. Uh, that basically gives you access to all of my co content that I create. Uh, you'll get high quality downloads, uh, images, everything, and you can reuse it for any of your own projects. So, yeah. If you'd like to support me and get a little bit back, then you can become a patron. But if not, I'll still love you. Looks like that's it. I'm always really bad at ending videos, so... The, the fuck is somebody watching Elmo? Do you guys hear that? It sounds like... It sounds like fucking Elmo's in my house. What the piss? I'm gonna go back and, like, boost that audio. Maybe I'm crazy. See if I can pick it up. Alright, anyway. Alright, I'm gonna... I'm gonna go get killed by an Elmo ghost or something. Bye, guys.